If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump. Where are we at, dude? In this remote episode, we're here in Austin, Texas in the uh, On It Fletcher House. Uh, find out why it's called Man, the Fletcher shout House. out to the boys at On It, Aubrey and Kyle, our boy Kyle Kingsbury, K- Kingsbury the Director of Human Optimization. Hooked like, it on, up. Setting us up. Yeah. Hooked they it up. Red, red carpet treatment, man, this time down. So for the cool. first 40 minutes, uh, we have our introductory conversation um, until and then we get into the questions. But before we get into the questions, let me go over what we talked about. We talked about the Fletcher House. Find out why it's called the Fletcher House. The story is way less interesting than you think. <laughs> <laughs> we, we overhyped it. We talk about using melatonin as a drug. Uh, we talk about cloning primates. Uh, should we be doing that or should we not be doing that? And are we I going? I am frightened. Have you seen Planet of the Apes? Yes. I have. We talk about the evolution of human beings, the plugged in versus the unplugged people. Yeah. That's a great uh, way to uh, categorize them, Adam. Plugged the, in versus the unplugged, unplugged. people. They, come, you know, they live yeah. underground. They come <laughs> out. Uh, we talk about Trump's tariff on Chinese solar panels, dumb economics. Uh, and we, t- we mentioned the Organifi green juice. Now, we are sponsored by Organifi. If you go to organifyshop.com and you enter the code mind pump, no space. You'll get a massive discount. We also went over Doug's Health IQ uh, life insurance policy. Quote, he actually got uh, way better prices from Health IQ, who is also now one of our sponsors. Um, and by the way, if you if you think you're going to die sometime in the future, <laughs> which is all of you, uh, you probably should get life insurance. If you go to healthiq.com forward slash mind pump, uh, you'll get uh, something cool. Then we get into the questions. The first question- The first question was, how has fast food changed over the years and what does the future of the industry look like as far as menu changes in order for these huge businesses to survive as people become more health conscious? More More Dorito tacos. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Fire Cheetos. Yeah, fire Cheetos. The next question was, uh, this particular individual says that we like to discuss insecurities as being a major factor. We've got lots of them. In issues. How do we recommend people get over insecurities and more specifically... What has helped us get over our own? Uh, Justin has an insecurity with his extremely handsome good looks. Yeah. We talk about that. In we this hug episode. it out. That's how I deal with it. The next question was, is it possible to build a food intolerance to seasonings? Like, Can you get a food intolerance to garlic? This answer will surprise you. Now, I'm Italian, and I think garlic is the food of the gods. Mm. Uh, so what do I You're have to say about probably a this? vampire if you can't do it. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's a, God, what if vampires just have a bad garlic intolerance? Yeah. Damn it. That's like all it was. <laughs> the, the final question was... That's the was, root of this. this. <laughs> like, the final question was, gluten. this person says that their their dad is diabetic, and uh, that's what motivated this person to have a healthy lifestyle, and it kills them to see their dad feed their disease every single day, and they feel helpless. What strategies do we have to help her or him convince their dad to change their diet to uh, maybe salt. Lots of, uh, what nuggets did you call that last night? <laughs> lots of, uh, what kind of nugget nug- bombs. Lots of nugget oh bombs in that one. Yeah. Oh, I just made that up. Justin, and, uh, hashtag nugget bombs. I have bombs. to live with it now. Hey, yeah, you know what? Nugget bombs. Early this morning, Justin woke up and dropped some nugget bombs. <laughs> dropped, I'm dropping nugget bombs all over all this Fetcher house. over the place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Also. Sorry about that, Kyle. I want to mention something extremely important. Now, it's been, it's been brought to my attention um, that there are some... Uh, some, I guess there's some wars being waged right now between different clans of people fighting over the extremely rare and valuable Mind Pump t-shirts that we're giving out. <laughs> I want to say this here. Uh, we do not uh, wow, condone wars? violence. Do not be violent. There's plenty of shirts to go around. If you want one of these shirts, don't go to war with your neighbor. Yeah. All you got to do is get yourself one of our bundles, one of our fitness bundles. And what we're going to do is we're throw in a free t-shirt for doing that. I mean, these shirts are... Uh, majestic is probably the best word that I can I can say. Some people have had mystical experiences putting on these shirts. Um, I'm making up all that, but they are free and they are t-shirts and you will get them if you enroll in one of our bundles. Now, we have several bundles. One of them is the Build Your Butt Bundle, which is MAPS Anabolic and MAPS Aesthetic with a mod where we teach you how to use them to target your glutes. So if one of your target areas is your butt and it's just not growing, 
get the Build Your Butt Bundle. If you're somebody who wants to be an athlete but also wants to be sexy, in other words, you're concerned with aesthetics and performance, then you get our Sexy Athlete Bundle, which is MAPS Aesthetic, MAPS Performance, and a mod that teaches you how to merge them together. Now, if you're neither of those things, but you're just super fucking serious, if you're like, look, I want everything. I am super serious about my fitness. I want to transform my body as fast as possible in a way that works. I want my my metabolism to get faster. I want to be stronger, more muscle. I want to be leaner. I just want to be generally uh, a better human overall. Well, the bundle for you is the MAPS Super Bundle. It's one year of exercise programming. In other words, from day one, you get workouts, you get exercises that we teach you how to do. We tell you the reps, the sets, the phases, the adaptations. I mean, we're basically coaching you through that entire year, through all of our programs. We've put them all together. We've discounted discounted them something like 30% off. It's the super bundle, and that also comes with a free t-shirt. You know what else I heard about our shirt, Sal? What? It's like armor against idiots. Armor against, I like that. Armor yeah. against idiots. That's what I've heard. So if you want a free t-shirt and you're serious about fitness, just go to mindpumpmedia.com and enroll in one of our bundles. We yeah. are turning these fuckers down. Coming you. live, dude, from the Onnit house. Right? From the Fletcher house. Yeah. The which on- uh, they named this house the Fletcher house. Better. And when they first told us, you guys, by the way, uh, Kyle from the Onnit uh Franchise or the, the automatic uh, director of organ- hu- the director of human optimization. Fucking powerful title. Great guy. We love him, and he's shown us phenomenal hospitality. They put us up in the Fletcher House. I'll be honest. When I first saw the, that we're going to stay at something called the Fletcher House, I was a little bit. I wanted to know the backstory. Yeah, I'm a little worried. I'm like, why is it the Fletcher House? What did Fletcher mm-hmm. do there? Yeah. Right. And why was it branded that? And then it's we like drove a up historical to the- like mass murder. Yeah, right? and then we drove up to it. And it's on Fletcher Street, so I think it's. Yeah, I, I think, think that's probably obvious. pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, probably, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Nothing cool about that. I thought there'd be a cool story behind it when we asked Kyle. Like, I, why I, is it no. the Fletcher House? It like wasn't it. haunted either. I was a little worried last night. You know, you didn't get uh, stay in a new place. It might be haunted. You didn't hear weird noises or anything at night. No, but you know, in my closet, there's like an extra little tiny door. And no, there isn't. Yeah, yeah. Did you open it? No, I was like, I didn't want to open it. You're up. scared. Is it locked? Yeah. Uh, no, it's open. I'm going to check it out tonight and see oh, if there's any the- little gremlins in there or anything I need to get rid of. Bro. Yeah. I feel yeah. like there'd be like ayahuasca ceremony or something. <laughs> <down> there. <laughs> yeah. <there's> like, <laughs> that's like the secret entrance. Yeah. You, know? like you, you open it up and there's like people like, we've been waiting. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm digging the house. Hello. I really like it, man. I actually haven't even been upstairs to check out your guys' whole little pad up there. I mean, down here is so nice and cool. I like the I like the modern feel to it. Dude, it's a brand new house, man. It's nice. It's uh, fully stocked with uh, Wet, stuff cool. we can eat and, and on it products that we can use on our skin, like the soaps and all that stuff. And yeah. I have to say... The shampoo and the soap is uh, it's nice. Yeah, I it like is it. Nice. It's uh, it's pretty good. We're not even affiliated. I'm giving them a plug. It's because it's because it's, it's, it's good stuff. Used some of their melatonin last night. It was good. Did yeah. you really? Oh yeah, you did. You sprayed that right in your face. Did yeah. you just do one spray My or six eyes. sprays? Uh, no, I only did a couple. I did good. Like two. Yeah, because uh, it says to do six sprays, which is three milligrams of melatonin. Mm-hmm. That's too much. Yeah, that's a lot. That'll cause your body to produce. Well, no, it'll make your body produce less melatonin. Yeah, but you have to do that consistently. Not one time is not going to hurt you. In fact, there's some benefits to doing like a mega dose after flights. I can't remember. That's to reset your circadian rhythm, right? Uh, But there is, you know, it's interesting. We don't know the how that feedback loop works. For example, if I gave you, if I give somebody uh, testosterone today we know how much that'll affect your testosterone immediately. And uh, and you do get an effect right away, but then it bounces back. And if you stay on testosterone for longer, then it affects it more. We don't necessarily know with melatonin, right? Like if I give you one big dose, are you going to get less natural melatonin the next day? Or does it take, you know, longer than than that? So I don't know. So if I, like, it, I've, I use it this way. And I think it was, I want to say it was Ben Greenfield or I don't or some article. Greenfield's real big on that. Right. Yeah. I can't remember he where. He pushes shit hard though. Who no, I, I know, of course. Yeah. So, and, and, uh, that's <laughs> You'd be not, injecting yourself with like stem cells. But and we travel, and we, we travel okay. and we fly so much. And when we get back home, uh, this is actually, I have melatonin that sits right by my, my dresser. And, uh, um, I take that like whenever we get back from a trip and it's the only time I take it. I don't mm-hmm. ever take it any other time, but I take like 10 milligrams. Of no it. way. Yeah. 10? Yeah. Do you have crazy vivid dreams no, with that? No, no. Really? Yeah. I sleep like a baby. I wake up the next day, feel incredible. <laughs> I feel like my, and I've done it before. Where I've you only just do one time. 
Yeah, like one to time. make them to, yeah. to okay. Yeah, one time. Yeah. That's it. That's what I'm saying. I'm, and that's why when you said that, I'm like, well, I don't know if Justin takes melatonin on a regular basis or even. No, I don't. Right. So I don't think it would have hurt him to do six yeah, only when I'm sprays and and because I, I I've done it. I didn't just go to. Uh, 10 milligrams. I have, I have three milligram and five milligrams. I actually have two melatonin bottles. So you bottles. slowly worked your swag. Right, yeah. I tried three. Didn't really feel like I got a, a real positive like benefit from it. Uh, five, mm, kind of. And well, then- I'm going to drink the whole bottle tonight. I'm convinced. <laughs> it's it's non toxic, but so or I, I shouldn't say non toxic, but it's very low toxicity. So you could technically drink the whole bottle, but I don't know. <laughs> right. My theory on that, this yeah, is just like anything else, like you brought up with testosterone. Like I don't. I think one one mega dose of it i don't think would would kill somebody or fuck up your 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 complete hormone profile but i definitely it definitely would not be good if you continually did that i know that for sure you know it would downregulate you for sure you it, i've heard they can be addictive too so, so the researcher who or one of the main uh, the the top researchers on melatonin science and of course i don't remember his name and i'm going to piss everybody off cuz i don't but i did uh listen to some interviews i did read some of his articles and he said that the ideal dose of melatonin is something like a quarter to half a gram of melatonin because of the effect on your own natural melatonin production. I did not hear what they said, though, about changing or helping your body adjust to its circadian rhythm. And I would assume that you're probably right that you'd need a bigger dose for something like that because he was talking about just using it on a regular basis. Right. So I ne- like I said I've had this bottle for probably uh, easily over a year and it's not even halfway gone. So I don't I only use it when we get back cuz that's I notice especially when we have somewhere here where we're a couple hours different. Mm-hmm. It's just enough to throw off my sleep and then I kind of feel groggy the next day. Plus we get so hyped when we're around each right, other like right. this anyway. Yeah, we're going 100 miles an hour and Fuck, and then it's yeah. even hard for me to come down when I come home cuz Katrina always wants me to download everything cuz she's <laughs> curious about everything. <laughs> you know, and and we've tried this before where I'm like, "Hey, let's just not talk until tomorrow." You know, yeah. then the, the that's awful, you know what I'm saying? So, and it eventually comes out anyways. And uh-huh. so, you know, once I, I rattle off to her late at night, I have a really tough time sleeping. So I will do this mega dose, or I call it mega dose. It's two pills, you know. Yeah. I have I have five milligram and three milligram ones, and so, I just take two of the uh, so you take eight. Yeah. Eight no, milligrams. No, ten. So f- oh, f- take a five two, and a three. Yeah, or? well, I have two bottles that I have. So you go two five. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. So I'll do I'll do a half to a gram uh, at the most, but I do extended release uh, also because what I did notice, I don't know if you if you noticed this or maybe you, Justin, did you wake up at all in the middle of the night? Yeah. Okay. So what I've noticed, and they've shown this in studies, is if you take melatonin, yes, you will sleep go to sleep faster and you tend to sleep deeper. But once that dose that you took wears off, it elicits this wakefulness response. And so what I've noticed for myself is if I take hmm. a pill that's not extended release. I'll go to sleep hard and I'll sleep good, but right around like 3, 3 a.m., 2 a.m., I'm like up. And I think That's it's because, it is that what happened? Yeah, mm-hmm. so I will get the extended release ones and that typically doesn't happen when I take those. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll fall asleep and I'll stay asleep. Now, is the, the so I should have gone like another two uh, sprays. At, so- what I would do is I have some extended release. No, this one isn't. Mm-hmm. This is a spray and it's it's it's, it's immediate. There is no extended release yeah. in the spray. Oh, yeah. So I'll they make it. pills that are extended release that are supposed to be better and mimic. A did you bit try better. their stuff last night? I didn't. I took the nighttime on it. What is it? The pack like or pack whatever. Yeah. Pack or but something. that that had things like valerian and chamomile and 5 HTP. And I'll, I'll is that what you fan. served all of us up? That's I what I gave you guys. I just yeah. trust you when you give us. I don't know. This is probably dangerous. It's not recommended. No, no, no. You can trust Sal me. just hands me pills and I just take yeah. it. Like, he's you like, can hey, place your this. faith in me. <laughs> if, you ever, if you ever fuck with me, you probably want yeah. to be a little worried, right? I don't know, dude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we were joking yesterday. What was happening yesterday? We were going to do, uh, we were talking about today because we're going to do an interview today. Uh, we're interviewing Aubrey Marcus uh, at On It and we were joking around and you were making that joke how you just trust whatever I take. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, I'm going to give him a bunch of shitty stuff so that I can sound better than them or whatever. <laughs> yeah. What were you telling you? You said what were you going to oh, give Oh, I was me? giving you the nighttime pack and you're like, what is this? I'm like, Ephedra. This is after you started. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what it was. It's going to wear us yeah. out dude, all night. Dude, so we got some current events uh, that I posted. Uh, two of them. One, one of them is controversial and the other one's way more controversial. So I'll start with the less controversial one. Uh, uh, so this is a breakthrough. Ramp up. Okay. This is a breakthrough now in science. For the first time ever... Uh, they have cloned primates. Oh, I saw you post that on the forum yesterday. They've cl- where? Uh, U.S. U.S. has yeah. done it. So they've is that Planet picture of the apes? Is that picture the actual actual picture of them? Yeah. So good. so we've only cloned so far in the U.S. Uh, I think it was sheep, right? Dolly yeah. and whatever. 
Now we've done it with primates, with monkeys. So we've actually cloned. The fuck is wrong with us? Now, China is doing a lot of research, and this is known on this type of uh, science. What we don't know, and always the fear of communist regimes in particular, because they tend to hide a lot of things. And hey, this is true for us too, though. Is how many? How much are they doing on humans? Yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. Like how much weird, so, shady. Stuff so I, I saw you posted, and you just put stop it. <laughs> yeah. So are you super anti on hundred percent? You know what I'm anti. Because let me tell you something. Especially uh, what's our Black Mirror? Nature. After watching Black Mirror, I have this like, what if though, bro? In our lifetime. We have not only figure out how to clone ourselves, but then also download our consciousness. So right before we're about to go, we fucking hook up a younger version of ourselves and d- shoot over to basically ourselves again. But we, fucking we have way what wiser. movie is that? that I don't one know where they they like grow themselves again, and then they end up like like taking uh, they put the their consciousness organs. into them. That's a and sci- it sounds like a sci-fi one. movie. Yeah. for sure. That's you your what, that's your job. It's right? messed up. You know what the problem with that is? The problem, is, and this is a fundamental issue with this. It's a philosophical one, but it's also fundamentally uh, it's Im- impossible to figure out. Is are you, if it were possible, which it's not right now, but let's say we're in the future and we've got this crazy technology, is that really you, or is that a copy of you? But here's the thing: what I say, who knows? Does it matter? It does, doesn't matter to everybody around you. It, it does, yeah, but it doesn't even matter to me or who I am or whatever, right? Or are you saying like you, I could die and then well, I? It's not really you because it didn't really have the same experiences. as But you. it does because it's got the memory of those experiences. Right. Well, it's it does. The, but you, you have to express those memories. I though. don't know. It's fucking weird, dude. Yeah. It's a weird mind fuck. Yeah, it's like embedded in the DNA, but like it has to. Go but it's through not its really own you. Experience. So like all of a sudden, like oh, yeah. daddy's it's back. It's probably a different personality yeah. until it gets developed. Or what it. if it's exactly? It's identical to you. It's got your memories, yeah. got everything, but it's not really you. And then that goes into the whole like. Do we have a soul? Do we have a? Dude, you know, thinking more? too deep on that makes me weird. Get weirded out. <laughs> I get hella weird when we start. Would you about, let yeah, your nah, clone like bang your shit. wife? That's what I want to know. Would I? Yeah. Only if I could watch. I know. So, uh, the, so anyway, so here's my problem with what we're doing is in in intel, you know, the worship worshiping intellectualism or science in general. Science is definitely not perfect. Yeah. Worshiping science is definitely not perfect. Anything you worship, anytime you worship anything, you got problems. And what I what the thing that that I fear about science has been proven over and over again is just because we can doesn't mean we should. Yeah. How many times have we fucking done this where we think we understand something? Yeah. So we fucking do We're it. We're on and a race like, to do what we can do, and yeah. like uh, by all means necessary, without thinking about the ramifications. Now it's like like there's really no slowing like there's there's nobody with brakes well, out there, there kind of like cautioning like well what if we what if this happens as a result of this well, new well there's also that conundrum too that like if we're here in the United States and this is something that we're talking about doing if fucking China is way ahead of us on there like <laughs> yeah we're in an arms race right yeah, if everybody was together and said yeah. hey listen let's not fuck with this as a planet and we all yeah. agree but we can't do that. So there's so, going to be countries and, and leaders that are that are you're right. that and are doing China this anyway. Doubles its population and that's so like the, a year. And that's <laughs> the, well, that's see, that's ah! that's the fear, right? The fear is, or the motivation, many times to allow this kind of stuff is like, hey, the other guys are doing it, right? But there's a couple problems with that one, and there's another topic we'll get into that I was going to talk about uh, that that covers us also. When you have a problem, the solution is usually not more of the problem. So that's number one. So it's like. Hey, you know, I can agree with that. There's that, but there's got to be exceptions to the rule, like this know. one. Because here's the deal. Let's be honest, and you and you talk about the evil in the world all the time, right? I think that China could all of a sudden produce a million soldiers. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, that's what and I, they like send them over. They don't give a fuck. They're clones. You know what I'm saying? Oh my send, god! Send them over to, to, to take over the United States. Like, see, there's a, so you got to think that we have to at least actively be on top of our science, so we know that. So here's the thing. First and foremost, those clones would be conscious. They don't have room for all those, those clones. Would be conscious. They would have their own. I know values I'm, that's totally exaggerated. I know what you're right? Saying. Yeah, you you get what I mean. Though, I where do. I'm going with. That. I do. But here's you know uh, here's the other. Uh, there's a few there's a few conundrums here. I'll give you an example that's different, so we can kind of understand what's what's happening here. Let's say today we all of a sudden discovered a way to stop aging. Let's say, oh my God, we've discovered the cure for aging and nobody will ever die of any age-related disease or just from getting old. And so immediately everybody embraces that because fuck, let's be honest, that is the ultimate problem of humanity is that we're all going to die. Everybody's going to experience the pain of losing someone due to age or age-related death. So it feels right, right? It feels good and it feels right to cure that. So now let's imagine everybody now lives forever. What we don't know is what are the unintended consequences of that? Yeah. Now, human morality and human ethics and human thought and consciousness is now ba- was based on forever 
the idea that the we're finite go- that we're going to die. Like, beings, yeah. what does that mean? Does that throw all that out of the window? How will people act? Will people become depressed because they don't have any purpose? Will people all of a sudden stop valuing mm-hmm. other, you know, certain things? And who knows what that could possibly mean? And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying we need to like treat these things like very carefully and delicately, yeah. and not be so narcissistic to think that. Because we can, we should, because we're so brilliant and we know all the answers and we just well, fucking do you, don't, do you get, I mean, do you feel that that's the way it is or could it be potentially like what I said, which is in fear of that there is another country that is ahead on the science. We need to be at least there on the science. So maybe we'll fuck around with some monkeys and eventually if they, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, so we're pushing the limits because we know they're already pushing the limits and we just need to make sure that we know what we on our hands. Not necessarily that we're going to start doing this or patent it or let other people do it or teach other people how to do it. It's like it's either going to be Planet of the Apes or some weird like vampire like <laughs> world. You know, you guys are, living forever. You guys are crazy, dude. Yeah. I don't know, man. Bunch of creeps. You know? I, I mean, it's look at let's. It's like the the fundamental like problem. Con- this conspiracy theories, right? Here. <laughs> dude, dude. By the way, this is an existential problem. This isn't just like a problem for me and you. This is a, hu- a, a human problem. Is that our knowledge is so powerful that we're always in these conundrums where it can be good or bad. Let's look at uh, nuclear power, for example. Right. When we discovered how to split the atom, like all of a sudden we have all this incredible, uh, you know, knowledge and power at our fingertips. We could create, you know, nuclear power, which can fuel our civilizations. And if we're smart about it, produces very little waste and does all this also awesome stuff. It also produced atomic bombs and hydrogen bombs, which so far has only been used twice destroyed millions but, of people yeah. but if now if was it was it wasn't einstein completely scared to death of that exactly yeah, that happening absolutely that, that was the fear of that of that that knowledge and information immediately he had the whereabouts dude, to think the oh, everybody shit. on that manhattan project dude and so far nuclear power has done or or nuclear bombs yes we've dropped two of them but the argument can be said that we actually probably killed less people than if had we not used them and so far Nuclear bombs have prevented another massive world war so far. And so far, that may show, that may be some evidence that humans, at the end of it, are kind of like, okay, we need to be cool and not all kill ourselves. Hmm. Because if we didn't have them, I'm pretty sure the Soviets and the U.S. would have gone into That's interesting. We almost need that, like, extreme. We need to know where it, where the end line is, you know? Like, that's the extreme end. Like, if we do launch one of these, it's going to wipe out most of humanity. So, and, there's like, well, we're not going to fuck with this. And that's what prevented... So, it prevents, like, you know, all this bullshit. That's what prevents... Look, that's what prevents, pa- uh, you know, uh, you know, Pakistan and India from going at each other. They don't like each other either, but they all have nukes. Yeah. And so, like, well, we can't go to war. Don't you feel like sometimes die. that we're just kind of going through this growing pain, though, of totally. evol- evolving as humans? Like, totally. I, I really would think that like a, a superior version of ourselves wouldn't be more violent. I, I think that it's it hasn't proven to be successful forever. I think the more evolved version of humans don't look at things that way. So I feel like we are at some of the scariest times when it comes to that. Um, will it get a little worse before it gets better? Maybe. You know, I don't think that we'll go all the. I don't think we'll destroy ourselves. I think that I would like to think that humanity is evolving better. Better. So- so I have a very I have a positive outlook like you because historically that's what's happened. But the, there have been corrections throughout all history where humans fuck up and a lot of people die and then people kind of learn from it and then you know they get better. The problem is our t- technology gets better, the the reality or the potential for our fuck ups to be catastrophic yeah. become much higher. It intensifies. Yeah, like you know, like if you look, you go back in time and you're like, okay, humans, you know, they believe. Let's say they believed in this, like, uh, in in certain theories or whatever, and they apply them, and you know, look at Marxism and communism, and that killed millions and millions of people. But you know, humanity survived. Well, what if we fuck up again with nukes or we fuck up with biological, you know, weapons and now it's got the potential to not just wipe out hundreds of millions of people, but everybody. You know what I'm saying? That's think, the fear, right? I think it's. I think we're gonna. Fa- I think the way technology is going, we're we're more likely to evolve towards the player one direction mm. than anything else. Oh, yeah. and then no one there. There won't be worry about war and stuff. There, if there will be any war, it'll be done virtually, and it won't hurt anybody. And, and we won't. And nobody will really interact with each other because they're stuck in their homes all day with some fucking goggles on their head. Yeah, <laughs> because the virtual world is better than their fucking real world. Yeah, and we'll have found a way for people to still. Do I, that's what I think is. I think we're building this alternate world within our world, and people are going to be plugged into it like a motherfucker. Yep. This is also why I think the counter, and we're seeing that right now. Talk about news. Uh, did you hear what Taylor was just talking about? No. With the, this right now, it's a hundred and forty-three billion dollar industry. Right now, is building these communities that cater to this like um, 
you know, they, you can grow all your ve- organic vegetables in there. The way the ha- the feng shui of the house is all set up, yeah. the light sunlight to hit it. A certain, I mean, it's just this. I mean, it, it's like uh, modern hippies. That's what uh, it, f- it feels like to me. But it's on the rise, like big time. Yeah. No, and I- that's the counter to this. The other part, which is, you know, we have this becoming so plugged in. So I feel like we're gonna ha- we're gonna see both these polar opposites, mm-hmm. and they both I think will coexist. I think you'll have some people that will revolt totally against it, and they'll want nothing to do with it because we've already proven as humans we could survive without it. And you'll have people that will do that intentionally, and there'll be a huge market of people. Mm-hmm. Then there'll be other people that don't even leave their fucking house because mm-hmm. how many antisocial people do you already know that already have a hard time talking to people in person and don't have social awareness? This just makes it even easier for them. Look at where online dating has gone yeah. in the last like five years. I know, bro. and you, I, I, I agree with you. Like and it was something when it first came out. Be mush. You made fun of people that did online dating. Yeah. Now yeah. it's the other way around. Like, yeah. oh, you met somebody in a bar. You actually went. Like, why wouldn't you just yeah, get that's online? Weird. That's a so waste archaic. of time. Yeah. That's a waste of time. You yeah. probably have to go through seven people that are nothing yeah. like you. We before. already we already have evidence of that. Obviously, we we have modern societies. We have all this technology, and then we still have Amish people who who right. who decide not to. I just think a majority of people won't want to. You know, shun it. Most people will want to be plugged in. That's why I think though it'll really be a major division there. Yeah, they got to figure so. out how to make like your your body not completely deteriorate yeah. and like go to complete mush if everybody. If you don't need your body, I think it'll go so big that there will be VR business. That's oh, for crazy. sure. You know, because people if, for sure they'll we'll be, be on like STEM, there'll be I businesses guarantee. that are built within the VR world, and there'll be yeah. people that you're you're either part of the plugged in people or you're the unplugged people. Mm-hmm. You will, mm-hmm. there'll be there'll be two real separate communities, and I think that's coming faster than anything else. And within that, I don't think there's going to be a lot of war between us. It'll no. be like that's well, how you want to live. That's how I well, live. so so on that point, one of the one how of the- easier are you to take over though if if you're the plugged in group of people and you're just laying there. <laughs> right, <laughs> they're gonna come in. <laughs> well, well so throat. there's two things. First off, I, uh, you're, I think you're right. The the more, for example, today the reason why China, who's the other world superpower, poses uh, not even a, a fraction of the threat that the Soviets posed to us is because we trade so much with China because we work with them so much. So we have this kind of mutual. Like not only mutual yeah, we can't, destruction. We're not going to kill each other because we're going to hurt our economy. Not only that, I mean, we could sense. destroy everybody, but right. if we fuck with each other enough, we're really just fucking with ourselves. Right, right. So there's, uh, you know, there, there's, uh, you know, that that's a big uh, a part of it. Um, but here's another question too about like this technology. We talked about online dating. It's posing interesting problems. For example, when you used to date before, you had kind of this finite, uh, you know, amount of options that you had in front of you. So here you are, you're a person. You have options in front of you for who you're going to date, and it typically there's there's definitely like, you know, equal in terms of looks and you know values and that kind of stuff, and it's around your town, people around you, but now people are being presented with a tremendous amount of opportunities, a tremendous amount of choices with online dating. Tinder is a good example of that. I think it, there's good to that, and I also think there's some unseen that's bad. Now all of a sudden, because you have this idea in your head that you can just meet a shit ton of people. Is that going to result in the reduction you of value? You just heard about the whole tender thing, didn't you? No. Hmm. Oh, so tender just, uh, they just got bought out um, or acquired or uh, either acquired or this big, huge company from China invested in them. And this company is known for selling uh, personal information and tender's already been hacked as far as getting in and, and and manipulating people's information that they're providing in their tender account. Wow. And so there's this, that, that's this, it just came, I just read this. It was in the hustle, I think yesterday, uh, yesterday or today that's going wow. on. Yeah. That's going on right now. Wow. Interesting. <clears throat> hey, so speaking of business, here's the other thing that's controversial. Um, and I, I, I knew it would be controversial if I posted it. I put it in my Insta story. So Trump, uh, just recently, um, I think it was uh, a couple days ago, imposed a 30% tariff on imported solar panels. So a tariff is like a, a tax, right? So mm-hmm. they come in, they're imported from China. We are going to make them 30% more expensive. Now, uh, the, I like that. the goal, so, okay, I knew you would say, I knew someone would say that and I figured, you know, it'd be you because it's you. Now, why do you like that? Why do you think that's a good thing? Well, because it's going to, it's going to, cre- it's going to force people to want to make the solar panels in the U.S., which will keep money in our economy. And if you're going to still go outside, which is fine, you can, we're going to make sure we make a little percentage on it for when it coming overseas. I mean, th- again, this is the, this is why. And again, I didn't go vote for Donald Trump, so I'm not like pro Trump, whatever. But these are some of the things I like that he's doing. 
I think economically, we're uh, the decisions that we're making are better than what we were making the last five years previously. So, he, so. so there are some things that I think he's done. This one is absolutely terrible, and I'll tell you why. There's a few. There's a couple fallacies, economic fallacies, with this. This is called protectionism or protectionist uh, economics, and it's been done in the past where the U.S. had lots of tariffs, and you know it never worked. And I'll tell you why it's terrible. First and foremost, it's a uh, it's a wealth destroyer. So the reason why Chinese solar panels are so cheap is partially because China subsidizes them. So a subsidy is when the Chinese government literally takes money from their population and decides that they're going to buy down the price of something to uh, boost up or artificially hold up a segment of their economy. So China's decided we want to protect or make our solar business better. So what we're going to do is we're going to take tax money, buy down the price so that other countries now buy our products because they're cheaper. Now, for us, the consumer, we pay less for their solar panels. But it is a, a destruction of wealth on China's uh, end, which, by the way, comes back to us. Wealth, it's a global economy now. So it's terrible that China does that anyway. But the solution should not be to throw more economic inefficiencies at it. All Trump is doing by raising the artificially, arbitrarily raising the price just of a- Chinese imports is he is making the American consumer now pay more money as a result. It's just more inefficiency. And what we don't see is we don't see the unseen, which is wasted uh, wealth, uh, more inefficiencies. What we think we're doing is we're protecting our so without but, without in, without involving China because we don't have a say in what they do, how do you solve that problem? Because more, I I agree with you that makes a lot of that makes a lot of sense because you're just re- robbing Peter to pay Paul when you right. think about it like that. But then what is the solution to that? Because otherwise our money is going to go to China because it's so, here, so much cheaper. So here's the problem. First of all, our, our our money goes to China. It comes back to us anyway, and it's the money that we save, so it's good. But here's the it's good on that end, except for the fact that it's you know wasted money on their end, which hurts everybody. Yeah, but you, well, you just grazed over that. You can't graze over that fact right there because that's the that is the point that now if they're getting charged thirty percent tax, there's thirty percent more money going going to to the United States, and we're still potentially going to make money off of China because so, they're buying from China. So it's no different than a, a central planner saying more money should go to low skilled workers, raise the minimum wage, or the dairy industry, you know, we need to save them because they're a fundamental industry in America. Therefore, we are going to uh, ma- we're going to add a tax to that, or we're going to make dairy farmers. We're going to make a law that says you can't sell milk, milk for less because they deserve that money. It's all extreme economic efficiency. And here's the problem: the problem with economics is many times we see a problem and we think that we need to come up with a solution. When in reality, many times, most times, the solution is to do nothing. Allow the market to do what it does because if we throw, it's like taking cancer, like, oh shit, we have cancer, throw more cancer at it. That's, that's not only is that a, a poor solution, but it only makes things worse. So, yes, China's doing something economically that's terrible for us and for them, by the way. It's not helping China. China's creating a lot of market inefficiencies on their end. Well, maybe that's part of his strategy then, yeah. too, then. I think his to str- make it more challenging. I, th- I think if Trump it is could a, be more, so see, that's on top the, of that, like, uh, you know, Having to break somewhat for like the solar companies here, tax wise, like is that like part of his strategy? Is so that- what I would, so that could be something different, which I would, which is always which better. Is something that I would, which is know, always better. More. I that would be a that would be something we could do because that just puts more money in the consumer and it allows the companies to spend their money how they see fit. So one thing that I would do is I'd say, hey, since China is placing a tariff, or or since China is subsidizing their panels and they're coming over here, and our guys are getting hurt because of this type of competition, then we're going to waive all taxes for solar companies here so that they can compete if they want to. And that, right. and that, and that like would be- elevate a, them into that scene. And that's more, of, that's more free market. You see what I'm saying? So you're, what you're doing, the solution- So to how it, do you know that's not what he's, he's going to set up and do? How do you know he's he not- He just gonna, added a tariff. Well, so maybe that's the first step in that. that would as well make a little bit more money while I'm getting everything else in place because eventually I am going to level the playing field and that's going to drive everybody to go to the- why. Why even go to China now if you're getting so, the product so for the tr- same price? Trying to level the playing field by raising arbitrarily raising the price or the cost of something isn't leveling the playing field. It's causing more inefficiencies in the market. Lowering taxes is giving money more money back to the people who earn it and who also pay the price for spending it poorly, which is always a good thing. Nobody will spend money better than somebody who earns that money and who pays the price of spending it poorly. And nobody will spend money... Ter- more terrible than somebody who pays no price for spending it terribly, who doesn't earn it. This is just a fact. So, 
if he lowered the taxes, that's always a good thing anyway. People you just tend defined to think, our government. That, yeah, basically, right? <laughs> basically. So adding a tariff is a terrible idea. Now, if Trump is an is a uh, a brilliant, um, you know, what is he called? Negotiator, right? Hmm. You could, and this is pure speculation. If I'm looking at Trump and I'm thinking he's like a brilliant negotiator and he's just playing ball with them, then what he's using this as is a way to negotiate with China. Basically say, hey, stop subsidizing your so he's shit. So, somewhat strong arming them. Maybe. Or, maybe yeah. he's using it as a no- negotiating. He's going to wait a little bit until China sweats a little bit and then he's going to say, fine, you remove the subsidies, we'll remove the tariffs. I could see some of that, but in the meantime- That's what I would think. In mm. the meantime, he's be, he'd be causing some pain for long-term success. But if, it's, if he's doing it to get more votes from the American voter, which I think is part of it, I think he's saying, hey, I'm saving your jobs. I think that's it. That's totally wrong and accurate. I mean, mm. be honest about what you're trying to do. But yeah, adding tariffs and adding taxes to try to compete with other markets. Because let me put it to you this way. Here's what ends up happening. Here's what's happened in history. I think countries no ma- start to compete I think no matter, okay, like that. I think no matter what, and this is, this is not just a, from the president. This is like when you work for a big company. When someone puts out an initiative or something they're going to do, when it goes out to the media, you're going to spin it to the positive no matter fucking what. No matter what my strategy is, if I'm CEO of, of a multi-billion dollar company and I've got thousands of employees working for me and I know we're going to have to make some hard turns right now and a lot of my employees may be upset because it's going to potentially hurt them, hurt mm-hmm. them right now, but the long-term move, I know I'm going to save this company. I'm gonna when you put that out to your company and you and you push it down. We were part of this for years. Yeah. You know what that's like. Bro, I it's would, no different from the president. It's on it's on an even more exaggerated level. But, so then when you're making moves, so if sometimes, I, I mean that's so if I was if I was in his shoes and I wanted to spin things right, and I see China doing this thing, and everybody's like, oh, unfair competition. We can't compete with them because they're subsidizing. I would come out and I'd say, and I I would I would satisfy everybody with this one, and I'd say, look. It, you know what? You're right. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to waive all taxes for solar companies here in America. That way they can sell their products cheaper. And conservatives will be happy because it's less taxes. Liberals will be happy because now it's looking like I'm valuing the environment. And China would now be like, oh, fuck. Now they're going to be selling their stuff for cheaper. Well, for, every, for every cause, there's effect. And you know yeah. that. And what we don't know, what I don't, at least I don't know for sure, what that potentially also could cause, there could be a trickling down effect that doesn't work. So that's to speculate that way and to be able to take some one little one little pat one little thing that's being put out there right now this tariff and go I would do it so differently. It's like well yeah it's well, really, this- and this is what I do what I hate about politics. Yeah. That's why I hate talking about it is because people people take take something they take a piece of it and you could tear you could tear anything apart or you can sure. build it up or you could spin it however you fucking want and that's the name of this fucking so, game. So let me give you an example of what I mean of when I say the unseen because. This is the thing about economics is there's things that are unintended and there's also the unseen. And the problem with the unseen is it's hard to sell it because we literally don't see it. So I'll give you an example. Let's say you have a town that decides to raise their minimum wage to $15 an hour. And a year later, they do a study. And in that study, they find that in the year that they raised the minimum wage to $15 an hour, they added 1,000 jobs. Now, the people who are the proponents of the minimum wage come out and say, hey, look, we raised minimum wage fifteen dollars, and we added a thousand fucking jobs. Oh, that's one example of a million of those but that always are happening. Always happening. Always. So now they're going to say that they're going to say, "Look, we raised minimum wage." That's and we, all politics. And we, and we is. Still, that's why it's so lame. And we bro. still. Add, all- but here's the unseen. The unseen is we may have added two thousand jobs, but because we raised minimum wage fifteen dollars, yeah. we only added a thousand. But because that's not seen, right? That's a hard argument to make. So by raising tariffs, by doing all these different things to to sound good to be a uh, you know uh, to be a demagogue. To oh, it's your, just like your, the argument yeah. that Jordan Stewart was uh, tackling with uh, the feminist woman that uh, went over the Jordan whole, Peterson. Yeah, Jordan Peterson. What did I say? Uh, Jordan. Yeah, I don't know. You Stewart. made a better Stewart. It's uh, <laughs> 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 a buddy of mine. That's hella funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he said the same thing. Yeah. Right? yeah. Jeez, man. But anyway, no, it's a, that's the. I mean, I don't know. I just I I don't like getting caught up in in mm. all that news because one, I do know it's being spun. It's, yeah. It's always being spun. I know. You know what I'm saying? It's always being spun and. People, when it's being spun the way they like to hear it, we fucking are all pro it. We defend it till whatever. So, and if it's something that you, it doesn't align with cards, your values man. or what you like, you're going to fight for it. It's like, at the end of the day, none of us really fucking know. Well, you it know could what? all be a bullshit fucking facade because what's really going on is some fucking scandal yeah. somewhere else. Probably. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? And most, it's just, just, just going to distract people. Distraction, yeah, yeah oh, dude. Come yeah, on. Most of it. Yeah, it's dude. terrible. Yeah. No, but I mean, and, you know, here's the other thing too. It's all a charade. Yeah, and here's the thing too with solar like solar power because people are always like, we need more solar power. That's better for the environment this and that the day that solar power uh, solar power becomes uh more efficient cheaper and easier to transport than uh you know carbon fuels like like oil the day that fucking happens 
100%, the market will replace oil faster than you can fucking blink your eyes. 100%. It will happen overnight. It's no different. I'll give you an example. 15 years ago, nobody, had, not that many people, not more than that. Let's go back 20, 30 years. Most people didn't have cell phones. Today, most people have cell phones, and that wasn't because we made some, you know, some law that said, hey, everybody, this is better for you. It's because people saw it was better and everybody bought it. And you go to third world countries now, and lots of people have cell phones. So are we going to have like the petrodollar? So the petrodollar will be like the solar dollar or something yeah. like that? Is that what we're going to do? Bro, think about that. Uh, absolutely. That's think what they, about that. That's what I think of right away what they would do. The same thing that we did with oil that we would do with now solar because we have no fucking gold's done. <laughs> Can't do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, so now what do they do? If it's not going to crypto, that would be your, that would be the only other direction I could potentially see it going in the future. Oh, man. That's Makes crazy. sense, right? That's fucking crazy, man. Yeah. Oh, man. Hey, thank God, thank God for the green juice we have here. We have not... Every time we travel, we don't eat enough vegetables. Yeah. yeah. We've been every eating, eating a lot of meat, but we barbecue. eat the veggies. Bar- barbecue. The green juice literally is a, a fucking life lifesaver. saver. In that, in that, I mean, it's not a good... It's a poor replacement. Obviously, vegetables are ideal, but... In a pinch, though. When I'm not getting any, I can tell the difference when I have the green juice no. into my digestion. Especially no. when I'm a little under the weather, which I've been battling this, this cold, and now it's just like, man, that thing is just... I have to have that around. If mm. I don't have vegetables, like, you know, on hand, I got to have that near oh, me. Oh, man. Yeah, it makes a big difference. Doug, you you were supposed to do, um, and maybe we'll bring it up on this episode. He did. He did the Health IQ, right? I was going to ask. Did yeah. you do the comparison, the rate comparison from Health IQ? Yeah, I ran other? a little experiment. And what I did is I went to the healthiq.com forward slash mind pump page. I got a quote from them. I put my information. Did you in. take the test, by the way? I did. You- 192, by the way. Wow, you beat your ass. Doug oh, is a champion. You studied. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I studied <laughs> the past 15 yeah. hey, years. Hey, he, yeah. hey, he's, he's been listening to every every episode That's of my right. pump yeah. now for last year. <laughs> he's been writing notes. Yeah. So I, I submitted my information. They gave me a call back right away. I did their application process, which took maybe 10, 15 minutes, which is a standard life insurance application. They ask all your health questions, your lifestyle questions. So questions like, do you skydive, for example? <laughs> all the time. Because, yeah. you know, that's not a good that, idea that, for life insurance. <laughs> yeah, that factors into the underwriting process. Yeah. And then they instantaneously gave me back a quote. So what they do is they go out to a number of different companies and they get back the lowest quote. And these are all top-rated companies, by the way. Mm-hmm. And I got my quote back, and then I right away took it over to my illustration software because I work with a lot of top companies myself. But there's a few that I use uh, on a regular basis. I ran exact same numbers, half-million-dollar policy, 10-year, 20-year term for my age. And these are A-plus companies. They were, as I look at my notes here, uh, Health IQ came back. Between thirteen percent and nineteen percent cheaper wow. than the best rates. Wow! Look at rates. that difference. Wow! I'm talking super preferred rates that I could get. That's a pretty the big difference. I work with. That's a really big difference. Yeah. Now, why are they able to do that? Is it is it because you know I have a, I have a I have a uh, I have an idea why I think that might be, but maybe you can correct me because you know this world better than I do. Is it because Health IQ their total sample size is made up of m- m- healthier people? Than other yeah, they're companies, super, they're super focused. So right? they, so they, because they Leverage have a lot of healthy people, they don't have as much risk, and they can pass on the savings. Well, understand, Health IQ is not an insurance company. They're like a broker. They're right? an agency, basically. Okay. Yeah. So they're they're putting it out. They're looking they're for farming. Yeah, exactly. candidates. That's right. what I'm saying. Maybe these agencies know that Health IQ specializes in this, and they give them preferred rates. Well, I think every company has different rates for their term policies, mm. and so what they're they can do is find the company that's specializes in the term policy or has the lowest rate for those type of term policies. And so they just have a lot more options. Now, the companies I work with, typically term is not their main focus. Their main focus is on permanent insurance or whole life type insurance policies. And so their rates may not be as good for the term products, but their rates may be better for the whole life products. So what Health IQ can do is they can go out and they say, okay, we have 50 companies. I don't know how many companies they have. So they're like Expedia or, or exactly or yeah. hotels. Or, or, or country, yeah. countrywide yeah. loans, even. God, you got to love. Well, if you look at loans, this is how most, most yeah. insurance, so if you're Clint Eastwood, I think even Geico does it this way too, is 
they get your information and then they go out and they they look for companies that will be take that risk on for the and then they they broker it out. God, you know what's funny? A that, lot of them do that. Not that long ago, it was an agent that did that, and an agent was a you know a person, and they go shop a few of them diff- for you. And agents in the past, I believe, would get different kickbacks, and so they had their own preferred companies. Now, because of technology, right. they're just yeah. like, they're eliminating that. Like, here's the cheapest one, right. which like Expedia. Like, Expedia is a great example. Gets rid of a lot of the BS. You know how much cheaper it is now to get to travel and stuff like that because you go through a company like Expedia versus going through an agent? It's, right. fucking, it's fucking amazing. So that's right. pretty cool. Good stuff, Doug. Absolutely. What's the, the skydiving thing? Is that just because if you're- <laughs> Higher if you're, risk. If, yeah, well, you're probably more likely to take risk if you've skydived. Right. right? So they ask questions- it's like, do why skydive? Why do not do fucking auto go-kart racing? racing? Do you do skydiving? Yeah. Do you ride a motorcycle? Most risky thing you, you can do. Yeah, do you fly? Like, is a private pilot? Do you do spelunking? Yeah. That's one of the questions. I What's spelunking? Like, spelunking's cave diving. Cave diving. Yeah. yeah. So they ask all these questions about high risk activities. So, scuba diving. What's that's the, the one that's where you jump thing. off like of a oh, building? Base jumping. Base, so that I, I I saw some statistic like the most deaths out of anything. Oh you man, can it's do crazy. Is, is Have you seen jumping. those people? With those uh, wingsuits. Yeah, the, yeah, the <laughs> squirrel crazy. suit. Squirrel Those people suit. die all the time. Those guys yeah. don't have life insurance. Yeah, no, there was a, there was a documentary <laughs> that, that came out that, and they were like following all these people doing that. And uh, I believe it was like it was six out of ten people from that documentary died. Yeah, what? I yes. don't recommend it. You know what's funny about? I feel Within like in like a, a couple of years. I feel like we need a certain amount of fucking danger and risk in our lives. And if if we make our life too safe because of modern technology and stuff, we end up going out and just creating it. We, well, we you have, know what I'm saying. We, yeah. we're either, like we don't get chased by a lion. Adapting or optimizing. When we go through these phases, right? We're, and even that, think of it in extreme sports. I, I think yeah. extreme sports is one of the best examples of that. Yeah. Like. Someone learns how to do like the backflip, and then for like the next year or two, everybody does everyone's it. perfecting that and yeah. learning to do that. And they broke through that. Then Dude, all of a sudden, why someone, roller coasters are awesome. Someone pushes the limits to the next thing. Oh my god, a double backflip! We've never seen this before. Dude, you know it's funny. So first off, why do humans? I know why humans desire that because at some point that was an advantage evolutionarily because somebody took the risk to go taste that food nobody's ever had, or takes the risk to go kill that animal to feed everybody. But uh, it's funny because I think animals do the same thing. Like I don't know about you guys, but you know how many times I've been driving down the road and I'll see like two squirrels on the side of the fucking road and one of them, well, right before I get there, run across the street and the other one will just watch. And I'm like, is that motherfucker is he- <laughs> showing off to his, how many, have you guys ever had that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Where they're like, watch this, watch this. A lot of squirrels that right don't make you. it, bro. Yeah. yeah. They don't always make it. Like he's trying to get some squirrel tang. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Showing off. He's yeah. like, hey baby, watch this. I'm he fearless. Is. Well, after I, I'm convinced you're probably right. After watching Flatten the 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 planet Earth two again and seeing how like all the, the way these the way the mating happens and the territorial, it's pretty crazy, man. <laughs> it's pretty funny. And then yeah. reading reading uh, Jordan Peterson's book right now, going through the hierarchy of the of the lobsters and how they how they deal with stuff, which is pretty. It's pretty <laughs> funny how they just fucking take from each other. It's just how it's worked fucking forever. Animals, <laughs> we're just animals. We yeah, we're animals too. All right, bring on the bird. <laughs> Chimera Quaz! Today's Quaz is being brought to you by Chimera Coffee. It's the only coffee that is infused with all natural nootropics for a cleaner, calmer, and more focused buzz without the crash. Click the Chimera link at mindpumpmedia.com and input the discount code MINDPUMP at checkout for 10% off! It's the motherfucking Quaz! The eagle has landed! Our first question is from Farron Holt. How has fast food changed over the years, and what does the future of the industry look like as far as menu changes or mergers, acquisitions, in order for these huge businesses to survive as people become more health conscious? Man, now, I don't know. Mm. I don't know. I think it's really have good, they evolved really a lot, question. bro? Think about it. Think mm. about when we were kids. Yeah, no. There's always a, there's a healthy menu. I'll give you, every fast I mean, food. Now. I'll yeah, give you one made example. Efforts, but... I'll give you one example of how it's evolved. Okay, I was. It's so funny that you pick that. You pick this question, right? Adam? Yeah. Okay. It's so funny you pick. I really this like one. it. I think it's a really good. Yeah. It's a very good it's question. Thought provoking. So so trip off this. So I was on. I don't remember what what page I belonged to on on Facebook, but I belonged to all these groups. And then someone posted a picture of a Big Mac, a Big Mac, excuse me, a circa like 1987. Oh, I've seen this. And it was the old- Tiny, dude. The, no, not Ooh, just that. It was the old- uh, No, 1986. It was the same size. You're going further oh, back. Oh. The Big Mac was the same, but the, the container was the old styrofoam. You remember the styrofoam containers? Oh, uh, yeah. There's an example of how the fast food industry has totally evolved. Oh, yeah. Because all recyclable stuff It used now. to all be styrofoam. Everything was styrofoam. Your burger, your everything was in these styrofoam containers- 
but pressures from consumers right. who yeah. were like, no, that's terrible for the environment forced everybody. Now everything's in a, in a wrapper and it's right. biodegradable. Right. So there's a good example of how things have changed. In the well, past that's how, market. okay. So I think that's an well, excellent point because that's the direction I see it continue to evolve and then offering healthy options. Mm-hmm. But I don't think you're going to slow down the consumption of the garbage food. I think there is a large majority of people that know, always be a demand that know it. damn well that it's not ideal for their body, it's not healthy, and they're actually the These majority. Cheap ass shit. The person asking this question <laughs> yeah. probably falls in the category of the no. In my gullet. No, you're right. You're right. Look at the marketing in the last five years. How much? What? Is, it's all about the dollar, the two dollar, now the three dollar menu. Yeah. It's all yeah. about. It's all about saving money, getting that's more calories. That's literally all they have. Do you, you know, get, you like, know who buys all that? By the way, do you know who who buys? Uh, who's the market that is targeted the most with the Cheap, fast, and yeah, you know, in the weird. I would assume it would be single mothers with three kids, no, shit like that. It's not. So I thought the same thing. Truckers. It's not. It's young men. Young mm. men, actually, really? Yes. If you watch the commercial now, pay now, now pay attention. If you watch Taco Bell commercials, if you watch uh, McDonald commercials, if you watch Carl's Jr. commercials, the Gordita Crunch Dorito covered this, that, and the other, and it's put it in your face and it's fucking awesome. And like it's, stoner students, it's young dudes, and the reason why it's young dudes is because women have been marketed to longer for health. For longer, women have been marketed to, I need to be healthy. And mainly it's because they want to look. Right. Yes. Right, Dude, right. you know what I've seen? God, what a great point. You know what I've it's, seen is like the merger of like all these sort of like novelty foods that are like Doritos becoming part of a fucking taco. You know, and it's <laughs> yeah. like they're, they're trying to like, like merge a lot of like our, our, our old memories together and like put it in this thing well, that's like a fucking... There was also something that started to happen as I was coming out of out of high school and seeing, and I remember I'm the oldest of six, right? So I have all these, or five, I have these all these younger brothers and sisters that I've seen with a huge age gap. And I remember this starting to happen, seeing it a little bit in my school. And then I remember like my seeing my younger siblings, like everybody did stuff like this, which it started to get popular to get like these fire Cheetos and then pour nacho cheese inside the <laughs> inside the bag and then just like eat it like this was yeah like they're a, finding out all those things and right. then they're putting it out there as like a right. product yeah. exactly yeah. so now what, what what I think is ha- that's that's Taco Bell all these fast food that's their response to the I'm waiting for the Wendy's like, now, like you know, fries sh- dipping into their member dipping into the frosty people yeah. would do oh, that God. shit all the they've time they've done they've marketed to that yeah. so they market yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, here, so here's what I think I think that the fast food market it's already shown there's already strong evidence that the fast food market is trying to cater more to the health conscious as being health conscious becomes more mainstream. And the uh, the example that I gave earlier of how these these fast food companies are who the ones who are trying to hold on tightly are advertising to young men because that's the segment of the population that doesn't care as much about their health because women, even single moms, are care a lot about their kids. And as the information comes out that they need to be healthy, they're still looking for cheap, but they're looking for cheap and healthy. And here's the other example that I have, or some more uh, examples. You have companies like Chipotle, which yeah. fucking exploded. Well, that's and a Chip- different class of fast food now we're talking about. Yes, which fast, is food, interesting. fast food is changing because yeah. now they're trying to be healthier and fresher and here right. it is, you know, more right. for Chipotle, Baja Fresh. These are all examples. But of catering to of- the convenience that people really want. Yes. They want it quick, timely, like on my lunch break, and yep. I want it fast, but it, like not horrible for me. That's right. That's and I right. and I really think this this is what we're gonna see. You're just gonna see more of that. Yeah. I don't think it. I don't think. Uh, I don't think you're gonna see companies like McDonald's and Burger King. I don't think you're gonna see companies like this collapse no. or or get overtaken by these healthy ones. But you'll see more of the type of Baja Fresh, Chipotle type of fast food places that will come about. Yeah. I think that's all that we'll really see. I think what's funny too is that you know now I have kids in school right now. So if you if you have a, a birthday party and you have a bunch of kids over, when we were kids, when I was a kid, when there was a birthday party, it was like a fucking treat to have McDonald's for everybody. And it was great and it was totally socially acceptable and it was all awesome. If you had a birthday party now and you had McDonald's for everybody, there'd be a little bit of social stigma. There'd be a little bit, especially depending on what class you're in. So if you're like yeah. middle or upper middle class, you'd see all the parents kind of be like, oh, that's not organic or oh, that's McDonald's. <laughs> but the funny thing is if you had pizza, nobody would really care. And that's like totally, and it's all about what's socially acceptable. <laughs> totally. So slowly what's happening, I think, is it's becoming less socially acceptable to go with convenient what we oh, consider wait till, wait, till the, wait till the campaigning on both sides. Yep. I predict this. Wait till the campaigning on both sides is going to look like this where you're talking shit about the other side. 
So it becomes like this, like the commercials will be about like making fun of healthy people who are eating at Chipotle, like starving, only eating a salad, looking all fucking emaciated. Yeah. Like it'll be like, sure, if you want to, or if you want to enjoy, and then it'll be like some construction worker it'll who be- looks like good, handsome, <laughs> biting into a cheeseburger. Well, like do this. you guys remember the, the Colossus burger? That Where was, was that? That was like Jack in the Box. Oh. It was like three patties of meat and like bacon in between each one of those layers with cheese. It was like the most crazy fucking awesome burger. No, but, but like, dude, TG, teenage boys don't give a fuck what they're eating. That's right the now. thing. So like, they're br- going to make it like they'll make more it cool. Ridiculous. Yes. Yeah, they'll make it cool. They'll be like, fuck counting your calories. Yeah. Fuck trying yeah, to care yeah. about this stuff. You Here, know? Here's so a eat, two, eat big, train big. But, be like that. <laughs> but as, as eating healthy gets, because young men are less typically, by the way, less interested in necessarily being, you know, watching their figure, being lean, that kind of stuff. They're more interested in like, I'm a teenager. I can eat whatever I want and I gain weight. I just want food and I want to perform well, right? As healthy food gets tied to performance, I think you'll start to see teenage boys try to eat healthy as yeah. it gets tied to oh, performance. Oh, that, that's happening right now. Yeah. You're already- interesting, dude. Like, is there a study on millennials and like eating fast food? Because yep. Yep. like, I guarantee it's gone down. Yes, it already has. Market-wise, yeah. it has gone down. But here's the part, that, here's what I think will make Companies like McDonald's start to go up again. First is catering to and showing that they're also more health conscious. But here's the other one. I think McDonald's being the the prototypical American company that was built from nothing and you know really stands for America, as you start to get this wave of nationalism come forward, uh-huh. I think that's what'll make McDonald's big, where McDonald's will come out and, be, and they're gonna show like old videos and old pictures of you know, uh, you know, McDonald's, the good American, whatever, your grandfather ate it, and you know, the the greatest generation and this and that. That'll get people <laughs> to go to McDonald's <laughs> for sure. Because now people are gonna be like proud of, you know, it'll be to- it'll be interesting. It, I, there was a backlash for a second it, against I mean, you know that kind of stuff. I mean, they 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 dominate the pie right now, and I think that you're gonna see a lot of these other healthy places, uh, and I'm like calling Chipotle or those like healthy by any means. I'm just saying that it, no, it's it, just the better option. Right. And they're, and they're marketing to being healthier. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it, I think you're going to see more and that'll get competitive. I think it'll become healthier and healthier. I think it'll become more organic and more natural. For sure. I think that you'll see these things. I don't think it'll ever even threaten though the other rest, the rest of the pie. I mean, you're talking like 80% of the population fall in the, I've uh, the, in the last month I've had McDonald's KFC yeah. or one of those things. Yeah. And then how many people have ate from one of the healthier choices. So I still think they're going to dominate the pie. I just think we're going to see a nice sliver start. To, it'll it's be, gonna- remember when we, I remember this, right? I remember the first one when it first came around here uh, where we lived, it was, I mean, I was driving across town to just go to this healthy kind of fast yeah. food place and it was only open certain hours and I was pissed all the time. Now in the Bay Area, it's sem- somewhat competitive. We can, mm-hmm. It's pretty easy for me to go find somewhere where I can get a pretty decently healthy choice. That didn't exist 10 years ago. You're just gonna, now, and I'm sure there's places in the country that it doesn't, still doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. I think what we'll see is it's becoming popular enough that it, you'll see these pop up in the types of communities mm-hmm. that care about those things, and you'll see that. Like did, earlier, we did it about. now. Who bought Chipotle? Wasn't it did McDonald's? It? Bought them for a while. There you go. But they sold them. I think they're gonna. I think they're gonna start hedging their bets and yeah. trying to. And you know, here's the thing. It's like, just like Nestle buying he, Nestle buying the organic here, garden. Here, here's the funny thing to me. And or Valley or part of part is. of me, my ego looks at this and like scoffs, right? But the other part of me is like, whatever, it's still good. Is the trendiness of eating, quote unquote, healthy. And what I mean by that is you have people who really have no idea what eating healthy is, but you see that it's kind of this trendy thing now where they're, you know, like, hey, everybody come over. We're going to have bone broth. Or, oh, that's like hey, this. And uh, it's like, it's like, you know, and it's like, you don't really know what health is. I know you're doing it because you think it's cool. Because that's you- this brain hacking community right yeah, now. Exactly. It's the same fucking community, dude. They're the same people. Like just yeah. all of a sudden we learn some shit about nootropics and all of a sudden it's like, it's, it's all about hacking this. It's like, listen, that shit matters. But dude, if you're still getting fucking high and drunk and then sleeping like shit. Like, <laughs> yeah, dude, not come on, bro. That like, that, effect. That's your fucking pills you're taking for $3 a pill is not helping I, you I, out I that know. much. Dude, you know, you guys remember, um, I'm, we're still talking about fast food, but like KFC and like um, Patton Oswald when he did his bit on like the, the double meat. So there was like, like two pieces of chicken. Oh, the burger with the fried chicken he instead was of fried buns. chicken instead of buns. And then like, he, <laughs> so, so he was making fun of it, you know, and it was like hilarious. And then he made fun of like their bowl. Like we're just like, like pigs just eating out of a fucking, uh, you know, a, a slot. I didn't or see that. I didn't see that. So anyway, so they're gangster, right? They came after him and were like, no, no, no. Like everybody, America loves it. Uh, and this and that. 
So they went all the way. I've been watching like the way that they've marketed and advertised since. And so like, dude, the, the ultimate like coup de gras, they came back. They basically hired every single like comedian they could to represent like, like uh, Colonel Sanders. Now, I don't know if you've noticed that, mm-hmm. but like, it, it's like it's uh, a smart strategy. Yeah, so now it's like, oh, you're going to fuck with us. We're going to get all of your friends. It's smart because now they seem cool and funny and hip and you know what I mean? It's, yeah. It's so what are they doing? So what they're doing is, uh, they're. have you seen the, the commercials where there's like a, a comedian who's pretending to be Colonel Sanders? Yeah. And they do these really funny No, I haven't seen commercials. It's kind of like- I get what you're saying. It, it oh, hurt, okay. I guess it hurt their sales somewhat, just his, his stand-up. And oh so, really? Because yes. they were mocking the company. Yeah, they're mocking. Now they didn't. They getting in trouble for slander or anything like that. No, no, no. no he's no, just no. talking shit. No. Like it's not yeah, like you can't fuck with him. It's yeah, a speech, you know. It's that's that's hilarious. But oh, yeah, you gotta ask. He's just doing it like a parody almost. Yeah, like, yeah. He's doing a parody. Yeah, it was a stand-up. stand-up. Yeah. Oh, you got to ask yourself when you when you look at some crazy, when you think about this. You this, would think that would draw more attention and help them and not actually hurt. This is this is a burger that has fried chicken as the as the bread. You gotta ask, dude. That's not real, right? He was talking about it it. in your hands. They (laughs) served that. That was for real. This did this this still exist? I don't know if it still exists. I didn't even know that. Yes. Are you kidding me, bro? I haven't been to a KFC in probably twenty years, bro. I ruined myself. It was like a meat sandwich. Maybe maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe like fifteen years. That's a long fucking time since I've been in one of them. Dude, I ruined myself with KFC. I used to love KFC, and then at one point, I was trying to do this bulk. Where I was trying to gain weight, and at this point, I got up to I got my body weight up to two thirty five, and it all came from force feeding myself. Everything. Do you know what made me stop eating KFC? I'll, I'll never forget this. It was during me trying to bulk up, just Same like thing. you're saying. I used to eat it all the time. Is this then, at Santa Teresa? Because so, yeah, it was down. The no, street. before even, oh, okay. dude. I, was, okay. I go. This all the way back to when I first started at uh, Capital McKee Day. So I'm like 20, 20 years old, and I used to eat chicken like crazy. And I remember when uh, this was before fucking. Uh, people had these abilities to figure out macros and calories really fast and easy. And I had to look up on books and I looked up KFC and the ratio of fat to protein was so poor in comparison to like a McDonald's burger. Oh, that's why you stopped. So I stopped. I, the whole time I thought I was getting, I was really getting more protein. I'm getting so much more protein because it's chicken. It's all chicken, right? But then when I saw the ratio of fat calories to the protein, I was like, shit, I could have my Big Mac, which I love and enjoy even more, and it's actually giving me yeah. a better ratio of, of fat to so protein. So my, my story is way worse because that's that's actually kind of Which, good. by the way, there's no logic to that now. That I no. think it's a bunch of <laughs> – that's <laughs> stupid. KFC used to that's tear That's just honest. That's, uh, that, that was my thought process well, that was back a, then. That greasy chicken. That was a more logical me. thought process for me because what I did was <laughs> – and I remember this, bro, like it was yesterday. So you, you remember – you know Ryan, my old business yeah, partner, yeah, a good yeah. friend of mine. So – that motherfucker just naturally is a big dude. And so I went head to head with him uh, to see who could gain the most weight. Now, here's a guy that walks around, never would never, if he didn't lift weights, he'd walk around at 220. So yeah. I, I was already in a losing game, right. but I'm extremely competitive. So I went to KFC because I'm like, I need more calories. I went to KFC and I bought a bucket, like for a family of five, of fried chicken. And I sat there and I ate the entire thing. And I swear to God, I smelled like chicken for like three days afterwards, dude. My my skin smelled it. like, and it made me so sick. You're lucky you didn't turn into one, <laughs> bro. I couldn't. I can't even. I can't even look at it anymore. It makes me want to throw up. I, did, I literally it's good ruined going it. down though. You know, yeah, no, oh, not it anymore. Tastes good, but no, you got to ask, tears you up. dude. I wonder. I want actually no. I I'll put money on this. A hundred percent. I guarantee you for some of these companies like KFC and Taco Bell. Their PNR team or their, their product development team, they're in an office and they're all sitting around and they're all getting really fucking stoned. And that's yeah, how they come up with their yeah, ideas, yeah. bro. I want, that's I, the only way well, you can explain the meat. You know sandwich. who did? <laughs> Jack in the Box totally goes after stoners. I mean, that's yes, they, open uh, 24 hours. Well, they were the they're first open they, they, were, they were so brilliant. That yeah. was like one of the most brilliant moves in fast food when they were the first one to say, fuck closing at midnight, yeah. dude. We're going to keep this shit yeah. open all day. Hey, when you have the munchies, they would even and say. I remember yeah. in high school, that was the place to be, bro. Every, oh, yeah. a- after party, there was only one place to get food. Yep. It was Jack and in the Box. And they make it hella cheap. The entire time. Yeah, tacos. I, I, lived off of, I live off of 20 tacos, tacos. for a Cause long stone, time. Because stoners don't usually make a lot of cheap, money, right? right? So like cheap, open 24 hours. Yeah. And Two tacos for 99 yeah. cents, bro. Because yeah. you know they're sitting in a room. They're stoned as fuck. And they're like, you know what? All right, let's write down three yeah. of our favorite things. And they don't really know how yeah. to cook. They're like dude. Doritos, Captain <laughs> Crunch, and fucking tacos. Oh, yeah. shit. Let's make a Captain Crunch Dorito taco. Like, whoa. Dude, in my town, Brilliant. Denny's and, and Jack in the Box had the monopoly on fucking all, all food service. After eleven o'clock at night, man, oh, yeah. every oh. single night, and you were in, you were either in Dick's good old or Jack in the Crack. Those are the two places. Oh, you know what? I tell you what. I talk about how my gut was is off, and I I blame supplements, and I blame. 
but I, I, I need to say this, a big other half of that equation yeah. was their shit food that I would yeah. eat trying to bulk Carl up. 100%. Jr., for sure. I 100%. So I, I, think, uh, I think the biggest thing we'll see, and as far as mergers and acquisitions, you're already seeing this happen with, uh, we just saw Amazon pick up Whole Foods, I, and I, you know about the Amazon Go store. So I think we all believe that you're going to see that same technology into Whole Foods. So yeah. we're real soon going to be able, I think that's fucking cool. That's not obviously fast food. That's no, all these like, huge companies are hedging but, their bets. Nestle, who bought Garden of Life, and right. all these major companies. But that's what you'll see. They'll still be, both will exist. And I still think that uh, shitty fast food will still dominate in comparison. And that's just because there's, I mean, if you're listening to this podcast, you're not, you're a minority. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? The majority is everybody who's not listening to this podcast. So uh, think of it like that. So I don't think we're going to see much really change. Yeah, interesting. Next question is from Cubic Kenny. I feel like you guys discuss insecurities as being a major factor in issues with other people. How do you get over insecurities and what helped you guys with your own? This is a tough one. So um, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on other people getting over their insecurities. But what I can say is what worked or, or how I worked on it. For myself. Well, I want to start yeah. with I don't know if you ever fully get over them, right? That's, a, that's an interesting you just I, recognize. I, I, I believe when when yeah. you have something, especially if it's a deeply rooted, which most insecurities are that mm-hmm. drive all the way back to childhood. And mm-hmm. I, I think it's happening in a formidable time of your life that it's part of you. It is part of who you are. And I think that Bro, you were just this is serendipitous. You were just talking about this uh, uh uh, 45 minutes ago with Taylor. Oh, you overheard us. That, yeah. 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 But, talk, if, if you don't mind talking about that a little bit. Well, what part of, we talked about a lot of different things. I mean, my, your, your my drive to succeed or yeah, whatever. So my, I had a major insecurity with, so I short sold my house. Um, God, it's been like six, five years ago now, five years ago, I short sold my house and I went through like a little depression for a while because um, I didn't, and I don't realize, and this is me speaking hindsight, right? This is at this time, I wasn't even aware of what, what, what mm-hmm. I was going through. I know it just beat me up. So I went through like this little bit of depression and I'm not a guy to get like that at all. And it, what I realized was I identified so much on success and good credit. And uh, most people that hear short sale of a house, they think like, oh, he must have overextended himself. He mm. must, you know, he must have took out a bunch of money and spent mm. it and been, you know, made a bad investment, right? Bad whatever. investment, yeah. not very smart move. And like I fell into that category. And in fact, it was actually a, a strategy that I was doing that was recommended to me to my buddy at the time who was a very, very smart guy. And uh, it did work out to my benefit. And it was a smart move. But outsider looking in, I knew it didn't look that way. Because every time I tell someone, they'd be like, oh, that, that was what they say right away. I mean, even Taylor this morning, when yeah. you guys see, oh, did you take out a big loan? Were you yeah. in a fucked up loan? I'm like, no, actually, it was totally fine. But my house was upside down. Well, not- the market took a fucking yeah, it reverse. Took, it, it took a shit. And, and it- you know what? We have to also paint the, paint the picture of the context. At this time, you're a young man. And up until this point, you've been extremely successful because you're hardworking, obviously talented, hardworking. You're making good money, especially for your age. You're very responsible. You come. You come from a poor background, so you weren't not. You were. You were. You know, lower middle class or lower class, and the people around you, or people who didn't know you, maybe even people, you know, from the outside, expected you to be a statistic that would normally. Well, and so now you identify with I'm successful. Well, also got a short sell my house. Like what you're saying too is so true. Is that you know? So not only did I grow up the that way where we didn't have a lot of money, but we also my my family was very irresponsible with money. So. Um, I was the opposite of that. And I did never wanted to be that. That was so important to me that I was responsible. I mean, it was 21 buying my house, like, and, and I saved all that. I didn't have any help or anything mm-hmm. to get there. And that was, that was a big deal for me. And it was a big deal that I'd never missed a credit card payment in my life. I had a 780 FICO score. All these things were so important to me. And, and they were all good things is what drove me. It's just going to like Lewis Howes and talking about the mask, right? Mm-hmm. This, this mask that I was wearing, what that propelled me to be successful. So why would I ever shun it or be, mm-hmm. it, but for the first time I, I was faced with it when shit got flipped on me mm-hmm. and that's what sent me into depression. I didn't realize it till afterwards that how much I identified with that because it was so important to me that people did not think of me like my family, what I came from. What a great lesson that yeah, you were given. That was a, it was a, it was a major lesson for me, and and it, and it made me uh, realize that I'm more than my things and the, the the monetary success that I've had and stuff like that. I'm more than that, and to not attach myself to that anymore. So it was a major growing 
experience for me, but I, it still exists. Like I don't think that I got rid of it. I think that's part of who I am. And and there's a part of it that I think I think I think that that's why I always you always hear us on the show too. We talk about your greatest strength is your greatest weakness. I think sometimes a lot of our insecurities drive us to be successful in a lot of avenues, not just financially, but I mm-hmm. think uh, in relationships and with fitness. Like a lot of these insecurities, some of the most the fittest people I know have the biggest insecurities, and that's what drove them to be that way. Some of the most successful people I've ever met in my life have huge insecurities. That's what drove them to be mm-hmm. that way. So I, I think that everybody has this or deals with it. And I think just becoming aware of it is the, the first the first right step in that direction and understanding what are your insecurities. And this goes back to what I always talk about when you get these state changes through the day because you're, you're, you tell yourself, you don't realize it, but you you give the, the flags go off all day long. Somebody says something to you. And part of, I was sharing something with Taylor too, that you know somebody could say something, it triggers something of me that I, I have an insecurity and then I can tell how I respond to that person if I'm s- kind of throw something venomous at them mm-hmm. or say some shit or notice my and my energy or my attitude changes like I'll reflect on that later on that night mm-hmm. for sure and go like oh wow and not about anything to do with that person everything to do with me and why did that bother me mm-hmm. why did I act like that yeah. and it's always rooted by an insecurity and I think that becoming aware of that and then being able to be smarter about the future decisions that you make when that comes because it'll it'll rise again. It's yep. guaranteed. If it's an insecurity of yours, you'll be faced with it again. And then now take that into consideration. Like, oh, I feel really strongly about this way because I know it's my insecurity. So even though I want to say this to Sal and be, uh, stand out like, ah, this is how I feel. Yeah. I also know that part of that's driven from my insecurities. Maybe I should back out a little bit, listen to him a little bit more. Let me hear more of your perspective and be have that open mind. Yeah. No, I think uh, insecurities are, we have some that are deep rooted. I think some pop up because of life circumstances. I mean, you could be, you could develop a insecurity as an adult. You know, let's say you're, you know, you've been married for a long time and then you're, you know, your spouse cheats on you and whatever. Now you've all of a sudden got this insecurity of, you know, are people going to cheat on me? You know, can I trust people? But I went through a very similar one. We talk all the time about our insecurities with our body images and all that stuff. And that was one that I had when I was young, but I had a similar issue um, in relation to success. So when I, when I first got into fitness at the age of 18, day one, uh, I was successful from day one. I was dom I dominated, absolutely dominated in, uh, at the time, the largest fitness organization in the world. And a very short period of time, I was managing these clubs. They were calling me a phenom. And it was just, it, was, it felt effortless. And may, I did work hard, but it was just something that I did very well and I enjoyed it. And when I left uh, corporate fitness, I went and opened up my own wellness facility. And I had a lot of learning lessons with that because here I was, and what the problem was is I, I attributed, I identified with the amount of money that I earned as being successful. That was the only metric that I really placed value on. It was how much money did I make? That's how much, that's my success right there. So now I own this small business. I'm working with other people. I'm having challenges in my personal life. And money-wise, it took me a while. It took me a long time to really start making some money with my business. And then I made some business decisions that didn't pan out. I had to make some other decisions. So for 12 years, I'm this small business owner. And I went from being this unstoppable machine, this hero, this fucking you know phenom in business to all of a sudden now I'm having these fucking struggles and I'm not becoming what I thought it would. Because I walked into it and I'm like, I'm untouchable. I'm going to blow up. And it didn't happen. It took 12 years for me to learn that. And if I look at that from a money perspective for how much I earned, I could say, wow, what a failure. I'm a total failure. And what it did in me is, it, it, and like you, I, I identified with being successful. So it was a very difficult thing for me to swallow because I had to reevaluate what success meant. Now, if I, when I started to understand that and say, okay, I didn't make shit tons of money. I didn't you know, open up 15 locations and become this, this mogul. Does that mean I failed? And I looked at all the other ways I succeeded. Well, during that period of time, I completely transformed and grew who I was, how I worked with people, how I managed people, my understanding of fitness and health to the point now where this is who I am now on, on, on this podcast. Um, it completely transformed me with how I developed relationships, how I valued other things in my life, how I started to develop you know, what I consider balance in my life. And so when I look back on that, I look at it as a total success and a learning period. And that's what I got from revisiting it. Now, if I don't, here's the problem. If I never did that, and if I never self-reflected, or like you said, if you never self-reflected, 
and looked at those things. And, and if you continue to identify from them, then insecurities are worth nothing. Right now, those insecurities don't teach you a goddamn thing. Right. That's interesting. Like uh, I always tend to recognize my insecurities. Like I, I feel like I've I've overcome a lot of insecurities, and that was like my biggest mission is to like recognize them, overcome them, or just like you know drive like completely towards that insecurity and like see if I can overcome this weakness or this area of my life that I know is something that always kind of. Like it, it, it keeps popping up for me, and I, I, I don't like it. I don't like that. Um, it, I think that's that, a great strategy. And so, you know, like, but I do see a lot of times it's still there, man. Like, I, I'll, I'll have a conversation with somebody, even if it's a family member or something, and um, they'll mention something that I've done or something in the past or this and that, and it'll trigger me. And and I feel like it, it, it always revolves around something that I'm not very good at, right? Or or something that. Um, you know, I, I've been overlooked hmm. uh, in, in that certain like aspect, and so I, I just like it, it's interesting because you could you could just feel the the change of energy in the way that I uh, communicate back, and then like I've only just started to kind of recognize how that that really tenses me up and how I project that onto hmm. somebody else. So well, you got you guys both make really good points because I think that there's another problem here that that we need to talk about. Adam touched on this a little bit. Um, I don't even know if you realize this. But sometimes we can look at insecurities and think to ourselves, like, we need to eliminate them all and never have them and be afraid of them popping up. And I think that's wrong because it's wrong. insecurities can be drivers and can be teachers. Mm-hmm. And if you're afraid of being insecure, you've now created another insecurity, which is being insecure about being insecure. And so it's, you need to be able to look at it, embrace it, know why it hurts. Like, I'll give you, an, I'll give you an ex- a personal yeah. example. I, the most recent time that I can think about that I got seriously challenged with insecurity, like, I mean, really got challenged was going through my divorce a hundred percent while I was married. One of the, the gripes that my wife, uh, had, uh, against me was that I was not super involved as a parent. Now I'm a very loving father. I'm a very expressive with my kids, but I wasn't involved in the day to day like she was. And I wasn't nearly as present as she was. And she would hammer this to me, and this became one of her major gripes. Well, now we get divorced, and now I'm 50% custody, and now I'm doing things for the kids, with the kids that I never did before, like mm-hmm. scheduling school stuff and you know their, their extracurricular activities, and I'm dealing with things that I've never had to deal with before, and I have to be organized a particular way, and oh shit, I forgot that he has practice, and we missed it, and now I'm this, and I was so insecure that all these things that she said to me were true because she would package them as you're not a good father, which I know is not true, right. mm-hmm. but it fucking hurts, right? Yeah. So I examined that and what it did is it motivated me when, before I was able to process it, what it did is it motivated me to do things that were uh, not beneficial, like buying more stuff for my kids to make up for it or giving them everything they want. Or getting more organized because you have to be to be successful. And that's, that's what I started to do. I started to look at it and say, okay, no need to overcompensate. There's a little bit of truth to this. There's a reason why you feel this. Right. And it motivated well, it wouldn't me to sting change unless there was just a little bit of truth, right? Yeah. You had to adjust things and like you recognizing that makes you even better overall anyway. So that's right. So that's right. Staying with the insecurity that I'm talking about, because I think I have tons of insecurities and what, what Taylor and I are talking about, I still see it surface. I see it surface even in my actions or my conversation. And so before it turns into something that could turn into depression or hurt me with a career move or something like that, it starts with that. And I think a lot of people ignore even their attitude and the things they talk about. And I give you an example. Uh, I, I had this habit and I catch myself all the time. I think I've, I, I've definitely gotten extremely better over the course of 15 years of being aware of this and watching it happen and getting better and better and better because it's a process. Um, you know, if I if I am in with, if I'm talking to somebody who I know is really successful, I have this bad habit of wanting to share my bankroll, and not literally my bankroll. Like, oh, I'm worth this. Money. You want to prove yourself, right? I, I want exactly. Why well, feel this need? And it, that's me reflecting. Obviously, going through. The, I'm just having a conversation, so it happens that fast. Mm-hmm. I'm just talking back and forth, but I, I, I'll do this where I interject things to let you know how successful I am, yeah. and it's like that's an insecurity of myself. Mm-hmm. And if you're a really smart guy, I see that a mile away when someone does it to me. Mm-hmm. So you know damn well that if this guy's as successful, or more sure successful than me, yeah. he motherfucker probably sees it right through me. Yeah. So by me, me just being aware of that and like sharpening up my conversation. 
conversation, that also puts me in a better position in, in a conversation or a relationship like that and, and makes you makes you feel and look much more confident when you do that. Mm. So this is something that like even being a, uh, knowing that's an insecurity, knowing it's driven, I've been successful from it, but then also being aware of it and then learning how to navigate around it because it will always continue to surface and it may not surface and show itself in this and rear its ugly head on you, but you may see it in the way you talk and your attitude. Yeah. And, and I think that's a, that's a great attitude because insecurities that you don't uh, visit and challenge and try to grow from um, end up they end up killing you. I mean, I don't know. Maybe, Dude, not, maybe it, not literally. Not even that. It, check out that. Think of it this way. Here's where I like to start people. Just start with your disagreements and your fights that you have with your, your boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife. Mm-hmm. That that guarantee, if you can take yourself, separate yourself from the argument that something that got you to even allow it to escalate to that, there's an insecurity rooted somewhere in there. I 100% agree. If you, the two of you, 100% agree. Otherwise, otherwise, you wouldn't get so heated. Exactly. About it. Otherwise, yeah. you wouldn't give a fuck. Otherwise, yeah. that person would just be rah, 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 yeah. or or they would make a point and you'd be able to be like, oh yeah, you're right. I right. did that yeah. without being like ah. But you if know? you allowed it to escalate to where it turned into an argument where nothing got totally. accomplished, it is totally. ever. And this is why it's always both totally. parties' fault. Then there's something that was said, done that's hit that triggered an insecurity of yourself, mm-hmm. and that you just you are given a gift right now. Here, here, Can you dive into that and figure that and out? And here's an important thing to know about insecurities that I've learned. This is my own personal experience. I've, of course, I'm not like a, an expert or clinical psychologist on this, but I've observed this many times with myself and with clients and just in the world around me. And that's this. When you don't challenge your insecurities, when you don't try to bring more awareness and growth to them, they will figuratively destroy you and sometimes literally, and I'll give you an example. If you never visit your insecurities with your body, if you constantly think my body doesn't look right, I don't look good, I don't look good, it will drive you to more and more dangerous things, uh, you know, anabolic steroid use, plastic surgery, extreme dieting, to the point where uh, you'll 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 absolutely destroy yourself. The same is true for money. If I'm constantly insecure and about not being successful, no amount of success will ever right. satisfy that. No amount of anything will ever satisfy an insecurity that you don't challenge and grow from. And that's why it's important because those insecurities cannot be quenched by anything other than what's inside of you. Right. And that's 100%. So right. that's where they become dangerous. And that's why I think it's important to, to look at them. Next question is from Carter's Consumptions. Can you build a food intolerance to seasonings like you can to a food eaten repeatedly for an extended period of time? For example, could you develop a food intolerance to say garlic powder or pepper? Oh, you can sure. You can develop a food intolerance to anything, sure. Because you can, yeah, you can get you can be you can be you can have an intolerance to garlic, and, and garlic powder is just a concentrated form of that. Mm-hmm. In mm-hmm. fact, putting tons of garlic powder on it, if you had an intolerance, would probably flare it up worse than actually having a garlic clove. So, I, so the reason why he asked this question, and I've I've been asked this question before, is uh, because when you look at the comment, like if we were to list the top five things that people in America are allergic to or intolerant to. They would look like this. It'd be dairy, nuts, uh, soy, wheat, and I don't know what the what the fifth one would be. Something you know that's really, really common. You figure you ask yourself, like, why are there things that they're so, that are so common? Like, why is a peanut allergy so much more common than say uh, an allergy to, you know, uh, you know, beef or something like that? There's a couple things. First and foremost, it's exposure. So it's it's expected that you're going to find more people intolerant to rice in Japan than you will find in the U.S. And if you study the literature, you'll actually find that that's true. More people are intolerant to rice than there are in the U.S. So part of it is exposure. If under the context of inflammation, if you have an inflamed gut, if you're consuming a lot of the same thing, that gives the opportunity for those particles, for those food particles to, to, to move through the the digestive system in ways that they're not supposed to or go through the, the the gut wall when they're not supposed to, which gives your body or your immune system more of an opportunity to develop antibodies. So now you've developed an, an uh, intolerance and an, an immunity to it or an immune issue to it. That's number one. But number two, some foods just simply are more immunologic. Some few foods are just more, more likely to create problems. And the reason for this, and what uh, what people think the reason for this is, is that foods have in them, many foods have in them, natural substances that make them more difficult to digest as protective mechanisms. For example, when you consume uh, eggs, for example, egg whites, 
far more people are allergic or intolerant to egg whites than there are to egg yolks. They're all the egg, and yet people with gut issues typically can tolerate egg yolk, no problem, and egg whites many times will cause an issue. This is because when you examine the egg, you find that the egg white uh, serves many functions, but many of some, one of them is to protect the yolk, and it contains natural antibodies. Now, cooking an egg destroys many of them, but many of them do stay present. So if you've got these natural antibodies, you consume them, you have this compromised you know, context of inflammation, boom, egg whites become more of an issue. Certain foods have this as well. Legumes are one of them, and peanuts are a legume. Gluten is another one. Dairy is another one. So although some foods you're more likely to have intolerances to, that does not mean you can't develop an intolerance to something that is that you eat all the time just because you Well, you know. and more often than not, that that is it, right? That I mean it's the food. I mean, this is why I think food rotation is so, so important. So though. important because it could be a healthy food that you become intolerant to. It doesn't matter if your gut is inflamed and that's what penetrates because you're and you're more likely to, to penetrate the, the gut lining if that's what you're consuming all the time and you just happen to be inflamed and it's like, oh shit, yep. you know, avocado is one of my favorite things to eat all the time. Yeah. And I have it every single day Dude. and I, it's healthy for you, so it's cool. But wait, all of a sudden I'm inflamed and that's now what so I'm So I'll never to. forget. Um, so back when I had my studio, I had a young lady in there that was a gut health expert. This was one of the things that she uh, that she really focused on. And at the time, I wasn't super on board. I was still kind of, I was transitioning from the bro, like macros only count, proteins, fats, and carbs to kind of learning about these things. And this is before I had my major gut issues that kind of forced me to, to look at these things. I had a client who came to the gym all the time, worked out all the time, and they had eczema. And eczema is uh, an autoimmune issue. It's your own immune system causing problems with your skin. And you know, we had this great environment in my facility. It was small where everybody talked to everybody, which was cool. I loved it. Like My clients came in, but other trainers talked to my client. Other clients talked to other clients. And it was awesome. And we'd have these big discussions. And so I had this discussion with my client about um, his eczema. And we're going back and forth and we're trying to figure out what's going on. And he's saying, you know, do you think it's food? And at the time, I didn't think food caused that. So I know. I said, it's probably your genetics. And we're going back and forth. And so this other trainer who was in there and she says, no, it's, it, it might be something that you're eating. You may have a food intolerance. And I, you know, I tried not to roll my eyes because I wanted to honor everybody. And so we had this big discussion. We're going back and forth. And she said, hey, you should try eliminating uh, dairy, gluten, and I think something else. It might have been uh, nuts or whatever and see if that helps. And so because this particular individual was kind of exhausted all their other resources, and they said, sure, let me try it out. And they eliminated gluten, dairy, and legumes, and nothing happened. Eczema stayed. So here I am. I'm thinking like, okay, so I, might, you know, I was right. I proved it. It's genetics. It's not food. And we went about our day. Well, this conversation continued in the gym on and off every time this client came in. And so finally, my trainer, who's the gut health expert, convinced this person to do an elimination diet and say, look... It could be anything. And I'm thinking in my head, like, of course you're going to say that because you got proven wrong. She said, you could be anything. Eliminate, you know, foods, go super basic, and then we'll see what happens. And the cool thing is this particular individual, this tra- this client that I was training was, uh, he, they were like a dream client. Like they would try anything. No, they sound they desperate. Would, they sound desperate for, for results, right? And they would yeah. adhere to it. Like right. when you do an elimination diet, you got to be super vigilant, which is one of the reasons why most people don't do it. So he did this and he did this elimination diet. And over the course of six months, he identified and he tested this several times. Like he went off, went back on, went off, went back on. And he fucking identified that it was bananas. Bananas gave him eczema and he couldn't eat bananas. Bananas? He couldn't eat bananas, which blew my mind. And And the reason why it was a problem for him was because he ate bananas every day, twice a day. He ate them for like a decade. It was like one of his favorite foods. And so oh, he developed an intolerance to bananas, eliminated bananas, no more eczema. And that was like my first like peek into, you know, what could be potentially happening with these things. And now we know, uh, you know, Rob Wolf talks a little bit about this in his book, Wired to Eat, where, you know, they'll do these continual glucose monitors on people and measure their insulin response. And they'll get some fucking weird shit, man, where yeah, it'll go all over the some place. dude will eat a cookie and won't get as big of an in, in insulin response as they will when they eat macadamia nuts or yeah. something that has no sugar yeah. and it blows everybody's mind. And that's because they probably have an intolerance to those macadamia nuts. So it's this is an important subject because what you need to understand and the reason why people in fitness and people in nutrition and health sound like they're all over the place, why you hear so many people say, 
this diet's better, that diet's better, this diet better. And then you have a lot of people say, uh, you know, just listen to your body. Everybody's different, which used to piss me off. I'd be like, what do you mean everybody's different? <laughs> you know? The truth is your immune system, your body is very unique to you, your experiences, your genetics and epigenetics, where you could have an intolerance to anything. Don't rule anything out. So if you're having these weird gut issues or weird skin issues or weird issues and you're looking at your diet and you're saying to yourself, I eat healthy though. Like all I ever eat is really healthy food. It can be anything that's causing these issues, including seasoning. Like this guy's asking right. this question. People just get angry because it's such a simple concept, but it's not easy to apply. You know, if you're going to go through something like that, it's a really regimented, you know, like focused uh, diet. How bad do you want to fix protocol? it? Protocol, but, but listen, it's so simple to where you it's going to reveal everything for you so i i highly suggest that dude how that. think about the paradigm shift i had to go through here i was mr fitness expert at this point I had been in fitness for i don't know uh 14 years or something top of my game right i know more than anybody i talk to or at least i think i do that's what's in my mind right like i'm fuck i know everything right and here i am i'm eating a diet that consisted of chicken breasts oatmeal whole wheat you know, products, you know, rice, you know, vegetables and fruits and nuts. And here I am with gut issues. And someone's telling me that what I'm eating is fucking with my gut. And I'm like, fuck you, man. I eat super healthy. This is fitness food. Yeah. I'm eating yeah. super healthy. You're crazy. You yeah, know, yeah. imagine the paradigm shift I had to go through. I had to look at what I ate and I had to realize that these healthy foods yeah, could be causing You have to get over yourself. Dude. It's, and then, and then of course people identify what their food. I mean, yeah, I, I have that exactly, dude, I've had clients who just, Man, they eat the same that's a barrier and thing a half. for breakfast and they've eaten the same thing for breakfast for 20 years. It's like I live and die by my oatmeal in the morning. Yeah. And I tell them like, no, you can't, let's eliminate oatmeal. And they look at me like I just told them to cut their arm off yeah, or something. You know? <laughs> I've literally had somebody like that. Oh, yeah. crazy. Totally. Next up is sincerely jazz. My dad is diabetic, Jazz. and it's a main reason why I started this lifestyle. It kills me to see him feed this disease every day, but I almost feel mm. helpless. I feel like it's too late for him to change due to his age, habits, etc. What are your opinions? Fuck. Dude, what do you guys, how do you guys handle that? Because I know That's, we're all in that same situation. Uh, well, I mean, I think that it's uh, something that we've all been dealing with for a very long time. And mm -hmm. here's my thing, man. And I just, it, it took me a long time to get this way. I'm dealing with this currently right now with my sister. My sister has got, uh, That's right. yeah, she's got stuff going on with her kidneys right now. And she's, uh, and she's pregnant. And she's not changing her diet at all. She's eating really poorly. And, and it's, you know, you got to know that's got to be stressing it even more. And, you know, I, I, you, in the past, I would try and force my information on, on her and mm -hmm. try and coerce her to eat better or make healthier choices. But what I've learned is that it doesn't really get anywhere. Um, the, the most traction I've ever got anytime with any family is, uh, is representing it within my own life uh, and exemplifying it to, on another level that they've never seen before. Like I remember when I competed, that was really when I kind of won over all of Katrina's family. Cause up to that point, we'd already been together for a few years and you know, the, everyone just knew Adam's a trainer, but nobody asked my opinion on anything. And I don't give it, you know what I'm saying? I've been doing this for a long time. I know it doesn't work this way. Um, and so I'd have to wait till someone thinks. And then when they saw what I did with my transformation and then taking it to that extreme, then now every, all of the family, everybody wants to sit down. Everybody wants to listen. And some of them, very few of them actually follow through on anything I teach them, but some of them have at least taken that effort of trying to apply it and do it. And that's the most headway I've ever had with any family. Otherwise, uh, the other way of expressing your concern or how, you know, I'm so sad, what, whatever angle you're coming at with your dad or family member, unfortunately, it, it doesn't ever work. It doesn't ever work and they don't ever receive it that way. And I think the best way to go about it is to continue to exemplify it within your own life. And mm. if otherwise too, and the attitude you have to have, or the attitude that I have with it is that everyone's going to live their life. And who am I to because if he only wants to live to 40 and go out with a bang and eat cheeseburgers every single day from McDonald's, like who am I to say that he can't do that? You know? And if I, and most people that are doing these things are aware of it. They're not they're, when you, especially when you have someone like that, who's, who's looking at something like diabetes, you're being told your doctor is telling you what's going on. Uh, so, and I'm, and even though doctors are not the best example, uh, I'm sure they told him to clean mm -hmm. his diet up. And if you have some of those answers and you want to provide it for him, but he's not wanting to seek that knowledge, 
you're never going to get anywhere we're, with we're, it. We're constantly uh, bargaining with ourselves. We're, con- we're The bargain is my present self with my future self. It is. It's a bargain. So if I say to myself, I'm going to abstain from this activity that I know I'm going to enjoy right now in order to save currency for my future self, then I'm going to make that bargain. So if I say to myself, I want to eat that cheeseburger. It's going to feel really good right now. Um, and I, it's worth the trade to my future self to enjoy this right now. Then that's the decision I make. Or I can do the opposite and say, this is not worth taking from my future to feed me now. So I'm going to abstain today to pay for my future self. So there's that. And, and one thing that I've learned from that, which has been effective for me, is to reframe uh, reframe the conversation. Because when given the opportunity, most people will choose their present self over their future self. That's just why we're impulsive. That's why we do the shit that we do. Like, you know, that's why we do stupid shit because we'd rather have it now uh, than later. You know, you tell a 20 year old, hey man, if you take care of yourself now, you're going to live till you're 95. Like, they don't give a fuck. They just want to have fun right now because 95 and 75 are both far away. So they don't really give a shit, right? Yeah. So I reframed it and I, and I tried to resell uh, the package. And I've talked about this before. I'm going to give this example again. I, uh, when I was married, uh, at the time, my wife worked for a tech company and I went to her Christmas party. Now, at this time, I'd always been in fitness and, and people in fitness are obviously very aware of their health, but I've, I tend to forget that most people are just not aware. It's not a thing that they think about. So I go to this dinner. We're at this you know, dinner. I'm surrounded by all these people who work in tech and they're bringing out the food and they have this, you know, first they have this, you know, basket of bread and they're passing the bread around and I pass it and I don't have any. Then there's desserts at the end and I'm not having any. And I know, uh, you know, I, I sense that people are looking at me because I'm a trainer and I'm sure you guys have experienced this. People want to look at what you're eating and want to kind of judge what you're doing because you're, you know, you're a trainer. Maybe they feel like you feel like you're, they think that you're holier than thou because you're whatever. So I get that feeling, but I'm like, whatever, I'm not going to, I don't want any bread. I don't want this and that. And there was this very overweight lady that was sitting uh, across from me, big lady. And we were talking the whole time and she was very gregarious and charismatic. And, but I could tell she was, there was, she was being challenged by some of the decisions I was making with my food when I wasn't having the, you know, the dessert. And she says, you know, Sal, because by this point now we'd become friends. And she says, you know, Sal, I had a friend that was just like you. And I'm like, oh, really? And she goes, yeah, my friend was into running she was into working out. Which, she, by the way, this statement coming is her a reflection of her insecurities totally, that she's dealing with. Totally, what she's going to say. I don't even totally, know what the rest of the sentence, yeah, but totally. you know what it is. So she looks at me, and this is in front of the whole table. Right. And she's, she thinks she's making this fucking amazing point. And she's like, you know, I had this friend that was just like you. So I'm like, oh, like how? And she goes, oh, she was a fitness fanatic. She exercised all the time. She ran. She lifted weights. She ate right. She looked phenomenal. Um, I mean, she was lean. She was vibrant. And then at 45, uh, she got ovarian cancer and she died. And after that happened, I, I said to myself, I will always just enjoy my life right now and never worry about anything because, you know, who knows what's going to happen and this and that. And so my response, I looked at her after she said that and I said, I didn't know what you said. And I said, well, that's, I said, that's terrible. I'm, I'm sorry you had to experience that. I said, well, there's a couple of things here. First off, we don't know what would have happened had she eaten terribly and not taking care of herself. Perhaps she would have died earlier. Perhaps she wouldn't have lasted long. I said, but we don't know that. I mean, the bottom line is we don't know the future. I could literally leave this, this, this restaurant, walk outside, get in an accident and die from a car accident. It's all about the quality. And I said, I don't eat healthier and better to live longer and to, to increase, increase my longevity. I say that sometimes and I think about that because it sounds great, but the reality is I do it because I live better now. And I said, and the truth of the matter is if you do it right, if you're not obsessed and you go crazy about it, if you do it right and you take care of yourself today, you will enjoy today much more. I said, for example, let me ask you this question. Let's say you were in optimal health. And this was when I kind of poked at her a little bit, but I wasn't trying to, but I know she felt it. I said, let's say you were in optimal health and you did it in a way that you enjoyed. So you weren't super extreme about it, but you were in optimal health. Now think of all your life experiences, your daily experiences, waking up in the morning, going to work, talking to your friends, watching movies, enjoying stuff. Do you feel like your quality of life would be better or be worse as a result from it? And she was silent. And the whole fucking table looked at me and was like, and I got a couple of applauses, which I, I didn't, I wasn't trying to like clown on this lady, but that's exactly what happened. So what I do now when I talk to people is I try to sell it differently. And I tell them, look, I don't fucking know how long you're going to live. And I'm not talking about, you know, but right now, if you're fit and healthy, 
I promise you'll well, experience sex will be better. You know, outside will be yeah, better. Yeah, but I'm going to go deep. Well, I'm going to go deeper than that mm. on this because this is let's be real, dude. The number one abuse substance in the world food. is food. Food. So it's like a drug for many, many people. And somebody who is getting that's diabetic from this, right? If you weren't born with it. So if you're if you if you if you get diabetes later on in your life from food consumption, that is a result of the this addiction to food that you mm-hmm. have. And not fixing that is still continuing to feed that addiction. People want and to so remain the, numb and unaware. So the problem is not with the food. Mm-hmm. The problem is not with his choices. It's why is he making those choices? Totally. Why 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 do you want to be disconnected or non present? To the point or or to ignore, like you're saying, Justin, why is that? And that is where if you're going to fix somebody like your dad or I'm going to fix somebody like my sister, and I know that. I know that my sister is battling other things right now, and the way she's the, the way she's taking care of her health is just an expression of that. Sure, it's resulted from the bad choices of food, but it's not the food's fault. It's what she's what she's covering up with that, and that's with almost everybody with these situations. It's anything, so, any any drug or and whatever. I can't do. provide that. I can't right. give that to this person. Now, as a family member, you can love them. You can try and be there for that. And like I said, the best way that I have gotten through to these type of people is to exemplify it in my life, so they want that because they the see. Old, yeah, the old expression: you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Like I, I've been literally dealing with this with my dad for a long time. And just recently had a breakthrough, so it's really what happened. It's not impossible, you know. People can change their mentality and their their mindset towards it. I think the the only problem is when when it gets to a point where like something health wise becomes like a real problem, you know, and they have a scare. And uh, this is somewhat of of why you know the shift and the change of mentality. Like I knew there's an opportunity there for me to kind of come in and help educate and kind of steer a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I mean, he was like getting up and down from his chair and getting really lightheaded and like having heart problems and all these types of things. And, and it's just, there's just so many different things. Like he's a bigger guy, six, seven, you know, he's like carrying all this ex- excess weight. Think about what got to him though. Was yeah. it, was it you or was it because he had a scare and that woke him up? Just like you hear all the time with people with drinking and driving who all of a sudden have this crazy accident, they live and all of a sudden they don't drink anymore mm-hmm. afterwards. Again, it's the addiction to the, the food and, so, and some people, and some people don't wake up from that. Yeah. Some people go through what he goes through and then, and, and then totally and yes, still they stay. don't respond at all. Well, and, and I think too, like, like if you're like really concerned, you just kind of look for those escalating kind of like issues and, and, and you try to just kind of be there. And, and I was always there kind of like giving little seeds here and there and just like, not, I wasn't trying to like, you know, I knew he was stubborn. I know he's stubborn. I'm not trying to like educate him, you know, I'm his uh-huh. son, but at the same time, like he would, I could tell he was becoming more receptive. And so what I, I was just starting like, Hey, check out this documentary, <laughs> you know, like somebody else is saying it on here. That's really like easily digestible. I know it's like within something you would do, you could watch it. And after he watches it, like it was the science of fasting. Oh, you yeah. watch that. He just, he got like super inspired by it. And I didn't see that coming at all. Dude, it's uh, well, that's a good point because you chose a really good moment to do that. Yeah. Like, if yeah. the, you know, he's already being motivated because of the scare, and then to help to provide some information mm-hmm. or knowledge to him in that arena, I think is a, is so, a smart strategy. So, I mean, uh, he, he, we're all experiencing this right now because we're all in our you know mid to late thirties. So, I'm being personally now faced with my parent, the real, the reality of the mortality of two of the most important people in my life, which are my parents. Now, they're not super old, but my dad just turned sixty. And this is when you look at health problems right around the age of 60 is when you start to see them start to creep up pretty quickly. And as every age, it goes up faster and faster. And so it's just something that I have to, it's something I have to deal with and grapple with. And I think what you're saying, Adam, is absolutely correct. Like, first, you have to accept it, like accept that they make their own decisions, because what will end up happening is if you refuse to accept it, if you refuse to accept it, you will ruin the relationship you have with that individual or you're fucking torment yourself. And let's be honest, yeah. if you don't take a, take care of your health, which includes your mental and emotional health, um, then you're not going to be there for them if they need it. Um, and you're going to end up hurting yourself. So that's number one. Um, so you can't force people 
to do anything. All you can do is be a good example and be there if they have at, if they ask questions. But there is there are a couple strategies that I've identified that tend to be more successful. One of them is the one that I mentioned where you reframe it instead of living longer or whatever. It's, hey, man, it's a lot better right now. That's one of them. And the other thing is anytime you're trying to change, and I learned this, by the way, managing salespeople. Okay, I, trust me, this is all connected. If you're trying to change a behavior that's, that is... Uh, you know, that has become kind of hardwired or it's become a part of someone's behavior. One of the best things you could do is change the environment. So let me give you an example of what I mean. When I had salespeople, I would notice after a particular period of time of managing them and we would get rolling and people would get cocky, people would start to get lazy. All of a sudden, this guy's not making as much phone calls. This guy's not hustling as much. This guy's not, you know, this girl over here is not doing what she's supposed to like she was three months ago when we were pushing and motivated and grinding. So what I would do is I'd come in in the morning real early and I'd switch everybody's desk around or I'd take their chairs away or I'd do something stupid where all of a sudden their environment is just a little bit different. Now they're standing or now they're sitting somewhere different or now I have them, sometimes I take their desk and put them outside. Now we're going to sit outside and you know we're going to talk to people or whatever. Just changing the environment, sometimes it's almost like it gives you this fresh like, okay, I'm in a new spot. I feel like every, anything's possible. I feel like we can start to change things. So an example of that would be, you know, uh, if I took a family member or if I go on a vacation with a family member, like, oh, we're all going to go to Hawaii. And when we're there, I can talk to them and be like, hey, listen, while we're there, would you mind if I, you know, took, took, took charge of all the food? Would you mind if I kind of manage that and controlled that? And I'll make sure it's tasty, but I'm also going to make sure it's healthy. And every once in a while, they'll be like, yeah, I'll agree to that. But because they're in Hawaii, it's a different or whatever. It's a different environment. Everything seems possible. So now I kind of convince them to follow this thing. And now I've had five or seven days. And now I start to ask questions like, how did you sleep last night? Oh, man, I'm sleeping really good. How's your digestion? Oh, I can't believe it. And I've done this with my dad before. Or I'll change the environment a little bit. And all of a sudden, my dad's like, you know, my back's not hurting me anymore. Man, I'm starting to feel energetic. And I'll point out like, it's because of the food. It's because of this. And because I give them the experience of what it feels like, <laughs> the odds become stronger. But by no means is it guaranteed. Because no. you are dealing with some hard shit yeah. to change. Yeah. Absolutely yeah, hard shit. Because they change. have to they have to eventually they're gonna have to, just like somebody who's addicted to drugs, eventually you will have to address because what normally happens with addicts is they trade one addiction for the next yeah. and they never really solve the problem. I've seen this countless times with even close friends of mine who, you know, battle with some sort of addiction and they've been clean and sober for 10 years. But then when you evaluate their life, they're they've just picked other habits up that they're extremely addicted to because what's happening is those people aren't really addressing the root cause. So eventually they will have to just change to face that. And yeah. I think for, you know, like I think that those are great tips for somebody who's a family member, uh, uh, but don't, don't let this keep you up at night because it will, it'll, it'll just put stress on just your relationship. Just accept it. Accept right. reality. Right. It'll, it'll just, you know, maybe they do want to live that way. And that's where I've just, cause I, and I got people that are family and close to me that, just, that say that, Adam, listen, I don't plan to live more than another 10, 15 years. And it's so hard to swallow. right? Yeah, it is. It's and for me, that's like, Oh my God. Like, but, who am I? And, and someone like who's saying this to me has lived a very full life. And, and I think as I'm getting older, I'm starting to understand that a little bit better because, you know, when I think about that, like, what are, what are some things that I really want to do or want to accomplish? You know, I've checked off a lot of those things, mm -hmm. man. I'm, I'm a pretty happy person in, overall. And some people may feel like they've already. And, and dude, let's be honest. The reality is the more you force people, the more they tend to dig their heels in and right. not want to fucking do something. Right. Yeah, and sometimes yeah. when you step off of you it- You can't force it. You know how many times I've like backed off and then you know a few right. months later, all of a sudden they're like, hey, Sal, would you mind no, You just me? remain available and you know understanding, but yeah, you let them come to their mm -hmm. own conclusions. Excellent. Hey, check it out. Uh, if you're listening to this on anything other than the Mind Pump app, uh, you're missing out. We actually have an app now and it's free. All you got to do is go to the app store- download the Mind Pump Media app and it lets you listen to the podcast. You can, at some point, you'll be able to comment. Um, it's got better features. It's uh, There's got a search function on there. So now you can search for topics. It's already better than your normal podcast app. And we're going to be uh, advancing it and growing it and we're going to be adding things to it. So get on there now and download the app. And also go to our YouTube channel. We've got some free workouts on there right now. And we've got some special stuff coming up uh, at the end of the month. So just go to Mind Pump TV, subscribe to our channel, set up your notifications because we're going to make an announcement at the end that you're not going to want to miss that will be time sensitive. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, 
and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.